Okay. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the 45th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, all members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference. And could I just ask all members who are on study to mute their mics, please? Um, our witnesses for today's briefing will also be attending via um, video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available. Hang on. The committee's web pages on the assembly website. Um, so, could I just ask all members who are online to, to mute their mics, please? So, just to remind other members to, to uh, mute their devices by pushing uh, it. There's so somebody talking there. So, item number one, then. Um, apologies. I don't think we have any apologies. None, none that we're aware of, Chair. Okay. So moving on then to item number two, which mm. is our draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting oh, held on no, the 16th know. of December at page five of your packs. So if um, members are content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay, so moving on then to item number three, which is chair's business. Um, at 3.1 of your pack, page 12, there are documents for the OCN and I research launch on Wednesday the 27th of January. The report is entitled to higher skills, ambition, skills for growth and social inclusion. According to the report by 2030, the North may have the fourth highest proportion of low qualified people out of the 16 OECD comparators. The report is promoting three foundations for success, to promote and fund a higher ambition for skills um, for economic growth and social inclusion, promote alignment across all phases of education to meet learner, industry and community needs and to promote collaboration for change. Um, the committee has already agreed that I will sit on a panel to discuss the skills um, at the launch of the report, which is on the 27th of January, and then the next day is our um, micro inquiry on skills on the Thursday, the 28th of January. So it's for members to note, unless um, there's any comments that anybody wants to make. Great. Right. Thank you. So moving on to 3.2 then, at page four of table packs, um, there is a, a blog piece from Argos blog um, regarding steel imports into the North carrying 25% um, duties post-Brexit. So if we could perhaps ask the, the department for some clarity around that, that <coughs> issue um, and any solutions that there is uh, being put forward in relation to it. Yep, Chair, if members are happy enough, we'll go ahead. Great, yeah. Thank you. Um, 3.3 then. The executive has declined to consider a paper from the Minister for Finance in respect of Budget 21-22. The um, budget paper has been submitted again for the executive meeting scheduled for the 12th of January. Understood that further delay may have consequences for the length of the related public consultation and statutory committee's opportunity to scrutinise the budget effectively. The Finance Minister has agreed to attend the Committee for Finance today in order to discuss the impact of the delay. Um, members may wish to um, view the relevant public proceedings in relation to that this afternoon, um, which is from 2 p.m. on the Assembly's live stream. Chair, we didn't get an update, so we don't we don't know if it was discussed yesterday. I, I hadn't heard anything more than that, uh, and that was the last update we'd had from the Finance Committee. So that's kind of what we're operating on. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Peter. Um, and then just at a final point, members may have seen the. The letter reported um, from retailers to the the um, Chancellor last night in relation to um, issues to do with the grace period. Um, so, if members were agreed that we would write to Michael Gove, yeah. um, highlighting the need for those grace periods to be utilised effectively and for the the TSS to be properly resourced to ensure that it's helping um, businesses effectively, because obviously the short time that they had to prepare between the um, agreement being agreed at the end of or the 24th of December and, yeah. and the uh, TCA coming into effect on the 31st has, has had implications and businesses <coughs> in Britain in particular that aren't prepared for it. So I think it's really important that that, that support is put in place. Chair, we'll go ahead. Members are content then. Chair, just on that, this retail round table group has been mentioned. Uh, have we any more details on that? No, as there... Um was there any specifics on, on that particular one? Is this the thing to do with uh, essential retail and click and collect? And stuff? Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't had any details through on that, just um, what, this, what there's been in the media, but we can dig in and find out. Okay. Uh, if members are content, because we'll, you, you know who it's going to be anyway. We know the, the, the likely people that will be on that. We'll go and find out what exactly is happening with it. Okay. 
Right, thank you. Chair, if I could just come in on that as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just want to echo your con uh, the concerns raised last night. To the, um, I think this does need to be flagged up. We met with the um, representatives from Henderson's group and from Linus Foods and from Musgrave yesterday. I think other parties have done the same. And the concerns that they are raising are extremely, extremely worrying. This is not just contrary to popular opinion about avocados and some high-end desirable, uh, desirable products, but non-essential ones. These are actual products, that are mainstream products that... If, if this carries on, aren't going to end up in our shelves, and the ones that are are going to end up at a much higher cost to the ultimate consumer. So I think an extension of at least nine months, potentially a year, to get this sorted out, and also to flag it up. We're hearing that it's not just, it's not here specifically because businesses here mm. have prepared. It's in GB where they're not aware of the processes and even or the, even the access to the support, the financial support they can get for their veterinary inspections, etc. So all this needs to be flagged up. It's just happened far too quickly. And the cost of freight as well, it's a perfect storm heading in because of the, the, the lack of shipping containers. Conta um, transport has increased sixfold in terms of shipping containers into in Northern Ireland. And a lot of um, haulage firms are now saying they don't want to do GB runs because it's not worth their while because of the amount of time they're spending. So again, costs are going to go up. So we're, we're only starting to see this trickle effect. But when it really kicks in, it's going to be yeah. hugely impacting. So I uh, uh, totally agree, no, and I think I, I we need some action we, we very quickly. We're looking to get um, some representatives in to talk to us about the impact over the yeah, next sure. couple of we, weeks. We have, um, initial season issues have hey, Christa, we have some extra resolved. capacity last week. We've had a, a brief morning department has dropped, so we have extra capacity next week, and I'm, okay. I'm fairly sure there are a number of stakeholders who would be very helpful to have in. So we we look at doing that and get somebody in for next week. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on then to item number four is our departmental briefing on the Assured Skills Academy. There's a clerk's memo at page 15 of your packs. There's a written briefing from the department in relation to the employer skills programmes at page 20. Um, the briefing is part of our preparation for the skills strategy micro inquiry. So if I could ask for um, Graham Wilkinson, um, Anne Williamson and Dylan Byrne to be brought into the spotlight please. Okay, Graeme, I hand over to yourself um, and to make a, an initial statement and then we'll open it up to, to members for questions. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you indeed for the opportunity uh, to provide you uh, with a briefing on the Assured Skills uh, Programme. As you say, Chair, I'm joined today by Anne Williamson, who leads the management of a number of our uh, skills programmes. Uh, as well as Dylan Byrne, who has first-hand experience uh, of the programme and will be able to provide members with a bit of a flavour uh, of what it's like to participate on one of our academies. Uh, we've already provided uh, members with a, a written briefing, uh, and I'm sure you will have a, a number of questions for us, so I will keep my introductory comments brief uh, before handing over to Dylan to provide his perspective in terms of the Shared Skills uh, Academy that he uh, attended. As you'll see from the, the briefing pack, the Assured Skills Academies are a pre-employment training programme that we have developed in close working relationship with Invest and I. Typically, uh, we work with foreign direct investment uh, companies as well as expanding uh, local businesses who have identified employment opportunities. Uh, the programme provides industry-focused training that equips participants uh, with the transferable skills that they need uh, to uh, compete for, for these jobs. In short, it's really about delivering training for individuals in, in the skills that companies are looking for, leading to a guaranteed job interview for those who successfully complete uh, the course. And maybe just to, to draw out a number of the, the key features of the programme for, for members. Firstly, it's that close working relationship that we have with the colleges, universities, uh, and those employers who use the Assured Skills Academies to, to develop the course content. Uh, and from my perspective, that is, is really important uh, to ensure that we have a shared understanding of, of the skills that the particular company uh, is looking for. Uh, but it's also useful for the education providers at the same time, uh, so that they have an appreciation of the latest developments in the marketplace. Secondly, I would say that the Academy model is designed to be a short, sharp intervention. So typically a course lasts for anywhere between six to eight weeks. 
so it is a relatively short investment in indiv individuals' time uh, to get a job in, in one of the, the employing companies. So from my perspective, I think it is a rather attractive option for the individuals who decide to apply to the academies. Uh, the model is also designed to be versatile, uh, and we have used it to upskill individuals in areas such as data analytics, financial services, business consultancy, software development, and cyber security. So a very wide range uh, of uh, subjects that we have used it for in terms of the various model. It's also open to anyone over the age of 18, and it's targeted to those who are either unemployed, underemployed, or indeed for those who are seeking a, a change in, in career. You'll also see from uh, the briefing we provided that uh, the program is fully funded uh, by the department. Uh, and in doing so, we pay for the cost of the course design, cost of delivery, as well as the recruitment and assessment of the candidates who apply for the course. Uh, for those participants who undertake the program, uh, they are entitled to a weekly allowance of £150. Uh, travel expenses, uh, and where it's applicable, we also uh, assist with, with childcare costs. I also think it's important to say, Chair, that our focus is very much on, on the individuals and providing them with, with the skills that, that they need. Uh, none of the funding that we use goes directly to, to the companies. It's for the delivery of the training, as, a, as I've just uh, outlined. In terms of the performance of the programme, certainly uh, we have been very pleased uh, with its performance since, uh, since its inception, uh, with on average about 80% of participants uh, securing employment. So that's a, a very high uh, success rate. And as I say, we have been very pleased uh, with this. And I think that success is probably down to two main factors. I think firstly, it's the calibre of, of the individuals that we have on our courses. Uh, certainly the uh, employers and the companies that well, we have engaged with have been uh, really impressed with the calibre of, of the individuals, and that has been an important uh, success factor. Uh, and also, secondly, the point that I was making earlier on about the close working relationships between the education providers uh, and the various companies, I think that has been a really uh, important element to why the academies has been such a, a successful uh, model. You'll also see that we have delivered a number of uh, collaborative academies. So, uh, this was a, a, a new initiative where a, a group of companies where they had uh, identified a, a number of vacancies uh, with similar skills came together uh, to deliver uh, an academy on, on, on a various range of areas such as manufacturing, engineering uh, and welding, just to mention a, a few. And certainly, uh, since we started, the demand for the programme has increased quite significantly. In the first year of the programme, uh, there were nine academies. That was back in 2014. Uh, and in the last financial year, we delivered 21 uh, different academies. So it, it has grown quite significantly uh, over the years. Uh, I suppose this year has been very, very different to, to, to others, as you, you might expect. Uh, however, we have delivered 10 academies uh, this year. We have six underway. Uh, and a further three uh, planned to be launched in, in February and, and March. But this year has been very, very challenging, and we've had to move our academies fully online. Uh, and that was done in a, in a fairly quick order of time. And uh, my thanks to everybody involved in that process. Uh, I think certainly the employers uh, have been very impressed how the academy model can still deliver uh, using that online uh, way that, that we have, have implemented. So... That has been a great success, and a credit to, to Anne and the rest of the team for, for doing so. Maybe, Chair, if I could just mention two of our other uh, skills programmes very briefly. Uh, they are Skills Focus uh, and Innovate Us. Uh, and again, both of those programmes are, are delivered uh, through the local colleges, uh, and it's our primary support for small businesses in terms of helping them uh, to upskill uh, their workforce. The Skills Focus programme is aimed at companies who have fewer than 250 employees uh, and want to improve the skill set of their workforce. Courses are available at Level 2 uh, and above uh, and include a wide range of subject areas such as digital marketing, health and social care, as well as leadership and, and management. So, as you can see, there are a very wide range of subjects that, that are, are available. Uh, as well as that, we have Innovate Us, uh, which offers free training to small businesses with fewer than 50 employees uh, and helps them to acquire the skills that are necessary 
in relation to innovative uh, projects. It delivers 10 to 60 hours of tailored innovation training to help those businesses, uh, whether that's a, a new product, a new service, or, or just to adapting the, their processes. Um, during this financial year, again, has been very, very different, and we have adapted our programs to make them much more accessible uh, to companies. We have removed the 25% uh, employer contribution, and we've extended the number of projects uh, that companies can, can apply for. And we've invested just over £2 million in both Skills Focus uh, and Innovate Us, and, and we've been happy with uh, the level of uptake with 1,500 enrolments in Skills Focus. And Innovate Us has supported 235 companies to complete 241 uh, projects. And certainly that's been our experience where companies over the last nine months have really taken the opportunity to, to look at innovative projects and particularly trying to help them to move to an online uh, way of marketing and selling their, their products. Uh, and that's happened in a very short order of time. And I think both Innovate Us and Skills Focus have been quite instrumental in, in helping us uh, to achieve that. So hopefully, Chair, that's given you a very uh, brief uh, overview of, of the various programmes uh, that we have. Uh, but I was very keen for you to hear from uh, a course participant to give you a bit more insight as to, to what it's like to actually uh, be involved in, in one of our Assured Skills Academies uh, and what works well. So. If I may, I would like to hand over to, to Dylan uh, just to provide his perspective. Uh, and again, we're more than happy to, to take questions uh, from, from members. Dylan, if I could pass over to you now. Thank you, Graham, and good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I just wanted to extend my thanks uh, for the great opportunity of speaking to you all this morning um, on this topic, and I welcome any questions, of course, throughout. Uh, so firstly, by way of introduction, as Graham mentioned, my name is Dylan Byrne. I'm currently 24 years old and working as an associate at Fintry Limited. My role has evolved throughout the two years I've been involved with the company into a uh, front office support uh, and process improvement role. Currently, I'm working for a tier one investment bank based in New York. Um, having completed the academy in 2018. Uh, this was completed in Belfast and I can assure you it feels like many moons ago now. Prior to this, I'd achieved a 2-1 in my business degree from Queen's. Although I did complete a year's placement in industry working for used cars and I, I felt university um, gave me the skills needed to progress my career in other areas. Having said this, I then decided to travel to the East Coast of America with the ultimate career goal of establishing myself in the consulting field when I arrived home in Northern Ireland, but without a, a clear map of how this is going to be achieved. Thankfully, I'd heard about Fintry and the academy process through a fellow Queen's graduate. I then applied while on my travels, and a few days after flying home, albeit while still quite jet lag, I was fortunate enough to be offered an interview, which I was successful in obtaining a place in the next Financial Services Academy. The academy itself was a six-week program for us based at the Belfast Metropolitan College and Ulster University, during which we took part in various exercises and sessions to build on our skill sets in all senses. This ranged from presentation delivery, know your client, financial crime and Microsoft Excel lessons with various competent and experienced individuals in their fields taking these sessions. The academy itself uh, helped to establish us with an immediate network of contacts and individuals joining the same company at the same time from a wide variety of backgrounds and at different career stages. Some were recent graduates from degrees of varying disciplines. Mine, of course, as I mentioned, being business management. However, others were from teaching, history, law, English, finance, to name but a few. Some others had experience in the post-academic graduate field, while others made the lateral switch from their respective industries of coaching, teaching, accounting, also to name but a few. Despite the great variety of the group which I've mentioned, we were met with the same consistent standard of sessions delivered, which equipped us with the skills and more importantly the confidence as individuals to advance in what is currently a huge financial industry. The support we received, both financially and non-financially, through the academy process and all involved was incredible, and I feel it has put me in an extremely fortuitous position to concentrate on growing myself, knowing that those great support avenues are fully behind me both within Fintry and those involved with the Assured Skills Programme. 
The transparent structure within Fincher itself, um, post completion of the academy, has also been conducive to growth for me. Um, I was then enrolled in Fincher's two-year analyst program, which helped me further develop my skills and grow my personal brand within the NI finance industry. Um, as an individual, I was given a clear checklist uh, to work through those points and gain my promotion. Personally, I'm extremely grateful for the academy experience and having held very little knowledge in the area before joining, the induction sessions in Microsoft Excel laid the foundations for me to grow uh, and train myself further in VBA programming. Um, I've developed this area as an interest outside of work now and I'll be able to say that I've implemented successful processes for the client, which are gladly met with positive feedback. I cannot convey my full appreciation of the academy process helping me personally as an individual amongst my peers also, as these acquired skills and others developed are immediately transferable in absolutely any area of my future consulting career. So thank you very much for listening. I will pass you back to Graham. Very good. I think that's been uh, really useful. Uh, Chair, that sort of concludes our uh, introductory comments and more than happy to have a, a discussion and answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, it's Dylan, for the, the feedback as well. It's really useful to get that. Um, and Graham, obviously, as you mentioned during your presentation, the pandemic has had an impact in terms of, of how this, the uh, programmes are delivered. Um, to how, how do you see that developing over time? Obviously, we're still in the same scenario where the majority of, of um, business is being conducted online. Um, do you, you think that that has a, a positive impact you know, going forward as well? Thanks, Chair, for, for the question. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let Anne uh, come in in, in, in a moment. Um, I think from our perspective, whenever uh, COVID first hit us, uh, we were very concerned, and I know employers were very concerned about the, the delivery of the model because one of the big benefits of it is actually having the, the group of, of individuals who are conducting the training coming together uh, and building relationships. So that's a, a real positive uh you know, outworking of, of, of the academy. So employers were certainly concerned uh, about that. Uh, but the move to online happened relatively uh, quickly. Uh, and certainly the experience, uh, the first one that we, we, we did online was Microsoft. Uh, and that has been a, a really positive experience. It was the first virtual graduation that I had uh, ever, ever attended. Uh, and it was great to see so many uh, individuals who, who had gone through that process of going online and the experience uh, seemed to be a, a good one. Uh, feedback from employers is that uh, they're very happy with how it, how it operates. They're very happy with the quality of the training uh, and how it's being uh, delivered. So um, certainly I don't have any particular concerns with that mode of, of delivery, but I suppose like everyone, I would much prefer to see the groups coming together and building that um, relationship between the individuals and that team working is so very, very important. And I think it is a real challenge to, to create that team environment uh, working across uh, re remotely. But certainly the skills that individuals are, are, are getting through the, the online delivery is uh, of equally a high, high standard as a classroom-based uh, activity. Maybe if I could maybe ask Anne just to comment on that, if she had any thoughts. And we can't hear you. No, she's she's in this. We can see her. You see on the on the bottom of the screen there. Anne, can you hear us? Nod if you can. She's nodding vigorously. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's happening because she she is in the spotlight, oh. but we can't hear you. No, it's moved. Oh. Now we can see you, Anne, but we can't hear you. You j have to sign. It's not coming up as mute. What's happened, John, earlier as well? Yeah. He's gone, I think, isn't he? Church, can't even church connection is really bad. <laughs> He's given <laughs> up. <laughs> He's watching TV. And I'm tempted to suggest do it through the form of mime, but that would be... <laughs> 
very difficult. I if we do my presentation through the medium of mine. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we maybe go back to Graham. That's that's okay, Chair. Um, maybe Van maybe wants to try to log log on. Again, I don't know. That might that might help. But yes, so we we're, we're very happy with with um, the delivery and and. Going forward, we, we, we expect to continue to do that, certainly for the, for the foreseeable future. Okay, no, thanks for that, Graham. Um, and I guess well, as uh, the pandemic kind of proceeds and, um, and we move into the, the recovery phase at, at hopefully some point in the not too distant future, there's likely to be increased demand for these types of programmes. And uh, as we see, unfortunately, when furlough ends, there's likely to be more unemployment and, and, and things like that. So there, there may be increased demand for these type of programs. Is that something that you are um, planning for and are ready to step up into that space and widen out into other fields as well? Obviously, we've seen, I suppose, the financial services and the digital skills um, really being the focus, I suppose, in a lot of the academies. Um, is there plans to kind of expand that out? I, I think you're right, Chair, uh, and we're already seeing uh, some of that coming through all, all, already. Um, for example, we have a number of, of welding academies uh, that are that are, are being in the process of being launched, um, and I think that is a positive where we have you know potential we have redundancies coming through Caterpillar, and we're 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 looking to use that type of model. To try and retrain those individuals and the skills uh, where, where companies are continuing to grow, and, the, and there is a, a, a big demand. So, yes, you're right that there is demand in terms of financial services, in terms of cyber security, but there's also demand for, as I say, things in, in advanced manufacturing and in other sectors as well. So, for us, it's really about getting a, an understanding of where the the job opportunities are, uh, and making sure that we are able to provide. The skills that they're they're looking for. So, going back to the point I made earlier on around a close working relationship between the education providers, the employers, and ourselves working in in close uh, partnership is really important. I also think uh, that the relationship that we have with Invest and I is is key uh, as well as we look for future job job opportunities. Uh, and again, we have developed that relationship and we're working very closely with them, uh, making sure that we can identify either new companies coming in or, or where there is growth sectors here in, in Northern Ireland. So that has been a really important element of, of identifying where, where they're at and how we can best support them and help them. Uh, and I would have thought, you know, even, uh, and we haven't talked about this, but even sure of during the, the the initial stages of the the COVID nineteen pandemic, we did introduce a, a wide range of, of new courses and programs. So that just really demonstrates the ability of the the education sector here to adapt and to change very very quickly. Uh, and I'm more than confident that we will be able just to step up uh, once things start to open up and things start to change and, and job opportunities be, do become uh, available. That's a positive thing. Um, and just one more question for me before I hand over to other members. Um, in relation to the, the level of qualification or experience you need to, to participate in the academy, is it a degree or is it two years relevant experience? Is there any, I suppose, um, concern around that potentially being a barrier to some people, maybe those who are longer term unemployed, being able to access these type of um, academies? Or is there perhaps plans to look at this, um, you know, widening out to, to look at, at it being accessible to a wider range of people? No, I will absolutely agree with you. Uh, I think we're heading into a very different in- environment. Uh, and it is important that we identify opportunities for, for individuals to upskill uh, and to use the academy model. Um, and I, I do think that we have done a, a range of, particularly the collaborative academies, whether that was in hospitality and tourism, whether that was in welding or, or, or engineering, where you didn't need to have a, a graduate qualification. And it really depends on the skill set that the, the, the employers are, are looking for. So they, it's the employers who determine sort of, you know, the, the criteria, and we are working very much with them. So it depends on the jobs that they're 
are available, the types of skills that, that, that are needed. Uh, and we work very much in, in close uh, partnership with the employers to identify uh, how we can best fill, fill, fill those, those opportunities. Uh, but you're right in terms of some of the, the higher end jobs uh, that the academies have been involved in, uh, working with the likes of Microsoft, PwC, um, Fintru and, and, and others. Uh, they tended to be for, for, for graduates, but uh, there are other academies that we've worked with uh, that uh, were for different uh, different levels of, 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 a, of a ability. Uh, and I see that sort of broadening out and, and widening uh, as we uh, look to come out of uh, the current pandemic and, and into a very different economic climate. Oh, look, thanks for that. I think that that's a positive thing. Um, I'm going to hand over to John Stewart, first of all. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Graham. Thank you, Dylan, for the presentation so far. Um, Dylan, thanks very much. By the way, I think that was really insightful um, just to get um, somebody that's actually gone through the course and uh, how the, the outcomes have you know, come about for yourself. I think it's so often we see these projects on paper and we hear from officials, we don't actually get to hear and see what it's actually like for the people that participate in them. Um, so congratulations on the success that you've experienced so far. Um, as well as I just want to touch on, how did you become aware of that scheme, Dylan? Um, did you find it easy to access? And um, on that subject then, Graham, yourself, do you think there's enough awareness for young people who are maybe going to participate in these schemes? How are we getting you know, awareness of these schemes out there? I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I let Dylan, I let Dylan, Dylan go first, but then I'll answer. Yes, no problem. Um, well, thanks for your question. Thanks for your comments. Appreciate it. Um, so I guess I heard firstly about the academy scheme through a friend who graduated from Queens, um, and you know I had an, also uh, one of my housemates applied. Um, so I think in terms of the promotion, it was kind of very organic but it was more related to Fintry from the kind of perspective that I noticed it. Um, I'm doing a bit of research and I find out that a lot of kind of my other peers across my uh, network had also applied for various other academies within the Belfast Metropolitan College. Um, so I think it's a very popular thing. For me, I didn't have a clue kind of what avenue I wanted to go down. So I think the fear for me was that in university, you're in such a nurturing culture um, where you can do whatever you want and be here you want and maybe for some young people the fear might be that when you enter full-time employment that could be watered down in a sense so um, I feel like the academy really helped me kind of clarify my own career path personally as an individual um, and talking to my peers the consensus is very positive and amongst the same that you know it gives us a quick kind of 68 week briefing on a topic and we can then say we have this industry specialized knowledge on that topic um, and that then is applicable to every kind of uh, business that we enter going forward um, you know and we're very we're very grateful for that of course as well thanks for that John um, in terms of John you, so your, your second question around uh, awareness you're, you're, you're right um, I, I suppose before the, the pandemic, w one of the big issues that we had was identifying a sufficient number of participants to, to run some of the, the, the academies. Now, that has changed quite, uh, quite significantly, uh, but I still believe that um, there's more that, that can be done to, to raise awareness. Now, you may or you may not have seen some of the adverts that we have recently launched on, on, on television to try and spread the news or of the, the academies because I think there is more talent out there and, and, and more individuals that we can attract to, to the academies uh, to actually uh, fill some of the vacancies and, and I know that there are employers who, who are very keen uh, to, to employ individuals using the, this type of model so uh, we, it has been a challenge for us over the years um, this year has been very, very different obviously uh, but it's something that I think we would want to look at to see if, if, if there's more we, that we can do. I think I think Anne is back online again, so I'll maybe ask Anne if she would like to. Can, can you actually hear me now? Aware, awareness. Yes, I can hear you. You can. Oh, great. Um, uh, just on on how we get our message out there. We have launched an advertising campaign on the 20th of December 
Uh, hopefully you will have seen it on TV. It's also on radio and there'll be billboards across, right across the whole country and different towns and cities. We also um, promote heavily on social media because obviously our target audience um, tends to be younger um, people. Um, there's no restriction in the sense if you're over 18 and you meet the criteria, anyone can apply. Um, so there is the social media um, advertising as well. Plus, um, we launch every academy with a press release. We do uh, bursts on, on radio as well. And uh, we promote through Twitter, um, Facebook, et cetera. So we're pushing hard. Graham's right, um, before the uh, pandemic, uh, we were concerned about numbers um, not being high enough. Now, the companies are incredibly uh, impressed by the caliber of candidates that apply. We did get a spike after the pandemic where we had one academy where about 500 people applied for it. Uh, now we have returned to probably pre-pandemic levels uh, where we're getting around 150 applications or 100 to 150 applications per academy, which gives companies a very good pool of candidates to select uh, the right people onto the academy that they hope will do well and progress and that they can then interview and offer employment to. Thanks very much. I don't know the one, but do you want to go around and we'll come back? Oh, no, go ahead. Um, that was very insightful. Thanks, Anne, as well, for that. Um, the final bit is just, I mean, where do you see the ceiling on this scheme in terms of if there was more financial support available for it, would you like to see it rolled out even further to, to, and more opportunities given to people who want the avail of it? I mean, I appreciate whenever we do come out of this pandemic and things start to return to normal and more young people are, are looking for jobs, um, do you think that there is the, the amount of potential candidates out there to scale us up even further? I think uh, the limit of the scheme is uh, identifying the job opportunities. To run a, a, an academy, we, we probably need anywhere around sort of twenty job vacancies to actually make it uh, va value for money. So that has been uh, the real sort of limit. I don't think financials or, or, or funding has has troubled us in in, in the past. I think it's ha having sufficient numbers of jobs. Uh, so that's why you tend to find that the, the academies that we run are, are larger companies who have. Uh, you know, twenty plus vacancies. Uh, we have done collaborative uh, academies in the past as well, so that's bringing companies from similar sectors uh, together, uh, and that has worked well in trying to um, combine um, sort of a number of of twenty plus. So it, it's sort of the the number of job vacancies has has been the limiting factor. Um, so the more that we can do, and we have been able to, to fill. Uh, those those spots. So I think that to me is is the big issue for us, John. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks everyone and keep up the good work. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Graham and Anne and Dylan for uh, the presentation and particularly to Dylan, I think uh, like John has said, it's particularly um, good to hear from uh, course participants and those who have uh, benefited from the academy and I think that that in itself is uh, how you uh, sell the program if you like and I, I think success breeds success so, so anybody watching today I think that that's a good example uh, of someone who has undertaken the academy and, and made a real success of it so, so thanks for that and I know there's many great examples of the academies out there and uh, we think of uh, Fintru and Alchemy, and I know that uh, the Minister recently announced the number of uh, places in the Academy for Fintru. I think the, the application uh, are, are still open for that, actually, and closing at the end of January. Uh, so, so there's lots of examples, and we encourage people to get involved. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on was around uh, the availability of, of such academies for those who have not graduated, those maybe who uh, leave... Um, you know, are, are leaving school, uh, maybe do A-levels. Could you give us some examples of academies that have been successful that have not been graduate academies? Is, could you maybe give us some examples there? Um, I think I, the, the main ones are, are, are uh, as I just outlined, is the, the likes of the, the welding academies, the, the ones that we've done in engineering uh, and uh, and those type of academies, they, those are the ones that have uh, not required a, a, a graduate type, type in. 
Um, and maybe ask Anne if she would want to sort of give a bit more detail in terms of uh, those academies and, and how they've operated. Yes, well, um, it is a demand-led program, and so the um, criteria, the eligibility, the level uh, that industry is looking for is dictated to by by industry. So we respond to that uh, demand. Um, on top of the welding academies, um, we've done CNC academies. Uh, those are collaborative and bringing several companies together, and they haven't asked for any qualifications on the welding um, collaborative academies. We did do a Danske Bank Academy up in the Northwest Regional College. I think it was at HND level. We did three academies up there um, with approximately 20 on each academy. Um, so we are open to it, and we've set the um, Assured Skills Programme that it is wider than graduate level, but we are led by industry, and that's the um, versatility and the responsiveness of the department to industry. We let them tell us, what do you need? And then we, we, we will set the criteria with the college, the company, uh, and that's how it's dictated. No, thanks for that. And in terms of the, so when you talk about the likes of the Welding Academy, obviously those types of um, activities would be more hands-on. Um, in terms of the numbers over the course of this past year, I'm assuming that anybody partaking in that type of academy, the numbers would be reduced, would they, in terms of just the physical nature of it? Is that is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we we ha we stalled um, some um, welding academies that were planned for this year, and we've just launched uh, um, new ones in Southwest College. We've launched two welding academies, collaborative academies there. We've launched uh, we're we're due to launch one in the Northwest, um, and again, obviously that depends on you know um, keeping people safe and COVID restrictions, because you're absolutely right. Um, you know, they have to be carried out in a welding booth and obviously those academies are dictated again by the facilities uh, because you need a welding booth. We can have to restrict those to 12 people on those academies. Um, but yes, depending on the COVID restrictions, where the first one we're due to start in February down in Southwest College. So if there are restrictions still in place at that stage, I know the current restrictions are due to end by then, but obviously we don't know how things will pan out. So we're waiting to see, but we're carrying on as planned at this stage, and we'll wait and see if, if there are further restrictions, and we'll obviously comply with that. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Guy. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, everyone, for your contribution so far. And I think we all were impressed with Dylan. I think he came across very assertive and, and obviously has learned a lot from from the academy, so well done to to him and all those involved. I think it's very encouraging to see results like that. Um, most of the points have been covered. Just the impact of lockdown, I suppose, has been significant for participants. Um, can they continue to to go through the work of the academy even during the furlough period if they're off in furlough, for example? Thanks. Or, uh, yeah, so as I said, the, the training does uh, continue on. Uh, the, the, the individuals that, that we have, they're, they're not employed by, by the companies, so they're, they're going through a, a training program. So for, they're, they're not furloughed uh, and they are able to, to undertake uh, the, their, their training. Um, some of them, and some as some I said, are not employed, no. No employees, no. They're not. They're all. Not employed. No, all the, all the tra they're all tra trainees, so um, they're they're able to to undertake uh, the, the the training. There's, there was no issue with that. And is that done for, on a full time basis then for a specific period? Yeah, yeah, the training is uh, on a full full time basis. Right. And what about the six academies? Where are they all based? Uh, do you want to pick that one up? Um, the academies at the moment are being delivered online. It's a pre-employment um, training academy, so individuals join the academies. Um, it's brought to them online at the moment. Once they successfully complete the academy, they're then guaranteed a job interview with the um, participating company. 
and only then if they're offered a job do they, they become employees. Um, you may also be thinking of our um, skills focus pro program which is for employees it does um, offer training to furloughed staff so you know assured skills is pre-employment is to get you into a career and, and, and kickstart your career skills focus is for those who are in jobs at the moment and we've certainly had um, demand for uh, companies wanting to upskill their staff obviously while they've been furloughed so that's been a great opportunity there where we have continued to um, upskill people um, throughout the, the, the COVID restrictions. Grand. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, John O'Dowd, can we bring John into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to uh, everyone thus far. And, and as everyone has said, I think John has given a very confident presentation uh, today. Um, can I just maybe just in terms of a question to Dylan? Dylan, you are quite clearly a very capable individual, uh, have a pathway mapped out in your head. You have had um, a successful university education. Do you think that there, there's a gap in the degree course in terms of what you are, what, how, how your degree, degree course is delivered, which would have assisted you in terms of your employability, similar to what the, the Assured Skills Academy has delivered for you? It's a good question, John, and thank you for it. Um, and thank you for the comments also. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's difficult in an extremely competitive um, postgraduate environment because you know there are very select opportunities and people obviously have high aspirations to you know achieve the really um, uh, prestigious jobs uh, but there are only select amounts of those i think it definitely has helped give a, a fit up in that competitive environment um, and i certainly made that kind of large step in a young person's life from university to post uh, or you know post education work uh, a little have or a little later rather and so i think it's made it a lot easier in that respect uh, it's equipped me i think and this is kind of often uh, not really noticed but i think confidence is a huge player um, and you know i gained a tremendous amount of confidence personally through my university experience but i think having the actual application of that in industry was very, very useful for me. Um, and uh, once you have confidence, you know, the, the rest will follow. And um, so I think that's kind of been a real, real help for me in that change uh, from university to full-time work, yeah. Thank you. And can I put a similar question to Graham or Anne? Is there an issue, uh, and this used to be raised with me when I was education minister about uh, the employability skills of, of or students at post-primary level, at uh, further and higher education level. Is it an issue of something we need to look at at that level as well, rather than having as an add-on at the end that we have to review how we deliver our degree, degree courses and others in terms of the employability of, of, of our young people? I'll, 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 thanks, John. I'll, I'll try and answer that and, and let her on comment as well. Um, I think from an employer's point of view, John, that is uh, a key message that comes through co consistently. I think the view from our employers is that we're we're good at preparing people or young people for, for exams and passing exams, but you're right in terms of those transversal skills, things, and Dylan's just mentioned them, around confidence, problem solving, team working, th those types of, of skills. Um, and uh, employers would say once they employ an individual, they have a lot of work to do with that person to, to make them work work ready so i think there is more that we can do to make sure that individuals have the life skills the work skills that they need uh, that employers are, are, are looking for uh in in the future so it, it is an issue um and that's why i i made reference to team working uh, that we developed through the academy model that works well uh, but it's something that i think we do need to consider in terms of uh, the curriculum at, at, at school and at university as well. How do we get, give our, our young people the skills that, they, that the uh, employers are, are, are currently looking for? So, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. There, there is an issue there. 
And whenever we uh, worked with OECD, it was one of the, the key issues that came through in, in their report, the importance of those employability skills. Uh, and it's consistent whenever you talk to our employers that they need to have individuals who are, who are, are, are work ready. Okay, just one final question, Chair. Sorry, did Anne want to come in there? Can, can I just say, um, I think also the factor of speed and how quickly we can respond to employers' skills demands is, is important. Obviously, if you're putting a subject into a curriculum, it takes much longer to do. We, a lot of our academies are in IT, cybersecurity, AI, robotics, data analytics, that type of thing very, very fast moving technologies, which we can upskill lecturers in and it can become part of the curriculum, but the speed at which we can move as an academy and respond to what employers are looking for is much faster than what an education system can do. So, um, and also when companies take those um, academy participants into uh, you know, their career, their, their job roles, they continue to progress with them and they continue to train them and, and I'll just say with Dylan there, he has progressed to associate level. So it's it's not it's never over. Um, you know, it continues uh, with academies with employment as well. Uh, Sorry, could I could I just add to 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 what what Anne has just said there as well, John? I mean, one of the key themes coming through from uh, this pandemic is the move to to digitisation and the importance of, of digital skills. Uh, and again, even before the pandemic, that was one of the key policy outcomes that we wanted in our skills strategy, is that digital spine right from primary school through to, to PhD. And that the, the pandemic and, and how businesses is changing over the last nine months, going online, changing their business processes. It has just uh, underlined the importance of, of digital skills in our education system and making sure that young people are, are prepared for what I believe is going to be a, a very different workplace than it was pre, uh, pre-COVID-19. pre uh, And I think those two factors, the employability skills, problem solving, uh, as, as well as that sort of transfer to, to digital skills is, is two of the most important features that has come out of, of, of this pandemic. And maybe just a last comment or, or question. Um, I would also like to see it uh, expanded to, to allow smaller medium enterprises to become involved because 20 employees means it's tailored towards larger companies. And it could be argued that those larger companies are, are well placed to train their staff. Uh, and and it's, it's a case in Dylan's case, there's continuous training. But I would like to see it, it, it being expanded to allow smaller medium enterprises to become involved, to allow them to expand their business as much as anything. No, I, I, I agree. Um, and, and I think we have tried uh, a number of collaborative uh, uh, academies. Uh, but I think there is a, a, an opportunity for us to, to maybe do a, a bit more around that. Invest and I have uh, developed a number of collaborative networks. Uh, Mega is, is an example of that, uh, bringing together the manufacturing sector. So the more that we can bring together, as you say, the SMEs and try to pull the, the demand for, for for jobs and the, the demand for skills, I think that would make it a, a, a little bit easier for us to run a number of, of collaborative academies. Uh, but I agree with you in terms of the, the demand. It is easier for larger companies to, to avail of the academy type model. So it is an area where we have, we have a bit more work to do. And can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Hi, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for the presentation. And um, I also would like to say uh, Dylan's testimony wa was excellent, uh, and it clearly illustrates the benefits of such programs. I suppose skills um, is the most uh, predominantly important issue for a su successful economy. And, and, and really, probably my uh, question 
is to to Graham in, in relation to the OECD report and, and he made reference to it a number of times in his presentations about employability uh, and about uh, digital skills etc and, and and maybe just kind of really to tease out like um there's lots of reports out there you know either we have too many graduates or we don't have enough graduates in specific areas of work how do you think that it would be best to address this because the assured skills program in the academies essentially what they are doing is retraining allowing people to have um, a, 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 another career or a different career or a, a more focused uh, career in, in a different pathway but is there a fundamental problem in our education system that we are having to then do further work? Ben, I think Sinead has froze. Of the academies and the academy programme because I love the collaborative approach. I love the fact that it's universities and businesses and it's demand led. But I'm wondering, is there any interventions that we could be using um, at an earlier point that um, doesn't necessitate these interventions at this point? Uh, thanks, Sinead, for, for, for your question. Um, I think there's always going to be uh, a need for, for these types of, of interventions. I think for individuals at, at 18 or whatever age, whenever they're making choices around what university to go to or what, what uh, courses that they want, to, it's very, very difficult for individuals to make that choice. I suppose I, I, I was sort of a product of that as well. I went to university, I studied uh, economics and politics, and they ended up doing a, a conversion course into, into accountancy. So it's very difficult for an individual sort of to, to make that decision at that point in time. Um, the other part of that, I think, Sinead, is the fact that our economy is changing so very, very quickly um, means that the opportunities are changing. The skills demanded from, from employers are changing very, very quickly. So I think it is really important for us to have a system that is able to react and respond and is agile to the, the needs of our employers. And if we're having you know, a, a program where we're picking an individual, we're training them for 68 weeks, and then they're able to actually apply for, and in many cases, in 80% of the cases, they're able to secure a, a job in one of these uh, one of these companies. I think that it uh, is a good outcome. Um, so I always think there's going to be a need to retrain and, and reskill individuals, primarily because of, of, of the changes in our uh, economy. I suppose the, the bit that I am more concerned about is the fact that if you look at our current level, labour market, uh, there are too many of our individuals who have no or are no qualifications, and the fact that our economy is changing so so quickly, uh, and the roles will demand a higher level of skills. I think for us, the challenge is thinking about how do we retrain or and upskill those individuals who have have low or, or no skills. And I think that is very much about working with employers and working with the business community here uh, to make sure that we can upskill them. And that's why I made reference to the likes of Skills Focus, which is a, a, a really um, useful program. It can be adapted, it can be changed to an employer's needs, but it's really important to get that message out to employers that they need to upskill their, their workforce. This isn't just for, for government to do. I think employers and business have a responsibility as well to upskill their, their current workforce because things are, are changing very, very quickly. And as I said to John, I mean, the, the digital piece, the transformation in the workplace is, is, is so, so significant. The last nine months has transformed the workplace. Uh, and when, whenever I say that, I mean it is moving towards a, a digital workplace uh, and that requires a, a very different set of skills. So the fact that we have these programs that are free at the point of use it's really for the employers to sit down and think about the skills needs that they yeah. need and, and how we can help and support them to, to do that. So we, we stand ready to, to work with employers and colleges in particular have done a, a brilliant job in, in delivering those types of programmes. So that's a very long-winded answer question, Shani, but it's a, a very open question. 
I know, and it was an open question. And I think one of the things from the OECD report that I, I found interesting as well was the fact that they 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 uh, indicated that there was um, a greater emphasis needed to be put into the post-primary school career guidance. Uh, and I think that that is, that, that is something that we, we collectively need to work at if we're going to get the skill base um, that, that uh, is required for our economy and for our individuals. And now this is probably uh, not a very fair question, but I want to give uh, Dylan a question. Obviously, there, this training comes, um, you know, 68 weeks training and um, there is uh, some support, monitoring support. Is that monitoring support enough, Dylan? Um, you know, there, there's a small training um uh support uh, financial support is it enough for, for the program is money ever enough but enough Well, thanks, Sinead, for your question. Um, I think to give a, a non-purposely vague answer, I think it's circumstantial. Um, you know, whether that uh, that amount is kind of uh, appropriate for everyone or if it's uh, helpful. For me, I'm in a very fortunate position. I've just come out of university. Um, although my um, fees from traveling were quite exponential, um, I think I was in a very good position where, you know, I wasn't um, in any other role uh, and I had support from my parents, um, luckily. But I think, um, you know, speaking to my peers, um, honestly, about the, the academy and the shared skill program, there were no concerns with the financial support. I think mm -hmm. um, possibly without that being there, I don't think, you know, it would um, be maybe an option for some, um, you know, having to leave their um, employment, whether it be, you know, part-time or another full-time role for 68 weeks can be a financial burden. Um, so I think definitely it helped, not particularly me per se, but it helped others. Um, in those scenarios, 100%. Yeah, I think for those maybe living at home or whatever, it, it, it is just the burden. But it, if you're maybe in a contract for rented accommodation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it, it might be a buyer. So I was just wondering in that aspect. But of course, it is circumstantial. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, and keep up the good work and as uh, an evolving picture skills uh, in Northern Ireland. Okay, Graham. Um, oh, sorry, you want to come in, Graham? You no, know, ju just a, a final comment to Sinead. I mean, she, she just touched on it there at the very end around pathways. Having clarity around the different pathways is absolutely essential. Where we have apprenticeships, we have traineeships, uh, and, and that has changed very, very significantly. And employers' mindsets have changed as, as to what they're, they're, they're looking for. Uh, and some of the other pathways that maybe we not traditionally have used, I mean, People would have gone to university or, 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 or whatever. Uh, but the way that employers are recruiting and upskilling uh, their, their, their employees has changed very, very significantly. So I absolutely agree on point about visibility on the different pathways and the benefits to different pathways is, is so, so important. And, and career advice is an area that we, we are very much focused on and, and will, again, be a key feature of, of our skill strategy. So I, I agree just with that last point that Sinead made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to all three of you for the briefing this morning. It has been very useful, particularly in advance of our um, micro inquiry at the end of the month. And, and I'm sure we'll be hearing some more from you in um, the not too distant future as well. So thanks again. Um, do members have any things they want to suggest at all? Okay. Back of that. Do you just remind us the micro inquiry date? The 28th, Gordon. 20th. Thursday, the 28th. Thursday, um, Alice. It's We're not. running at 10 until 12, and members' slot is sort of 11.15 till 12. Um, I appreciate members of other committees that day. Once we've got a way of doing it on Starleaf, that means we can do it as part of a committee meeting, but that, that facility's just not there yet. So it'll be done online? It's a Zoom. It's going to be through Zoom. So we, right. we'll set that all up and send out all the invitations and so on. That's already in hand. The first session's at 10, is it? So 10 until 12, members join for the feedback session, 11.15 until noon. So we'll have all of the timings sent yeah. out for members as well. Um, there'll be breakout rooms, 10.15 till 11.15, then members come for the feedback session. Good, thank you. Okay, then, um, if members are happy enough, we'll move on to our, our next briefing which is um, also from the Department on January Monitoring. There is a clerk's memo at page six of the table papers 
and a written briefing from the department um, at page nine of your table papers. There was a delay on issue in the final paper to the committee um, as a result of the extension to the submission process for the monitoring round. Um, as part of January monitoring, DFE has submitted bids of 33.9 million for five inescapable non-COVID pressures and five COVID-19 bids totaling 54.7 million to support economic recovery and one high priority bid of eight million in respect of higher education for quality related um, research. So if I could just ask to bring into the spotlight um, Sharon Hetherington, Joanna and Joanna Pack, please. Park. Sorry, Park, that oh, was a sorry, misprint. Park. Sorry, check. Is a misprint in my pack or my notes. Um, so if I could hand over to yourself, um, Sharon, just to make an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, Chair. Um, as you've said, I'm joined by my colleague, Joanna Park, um, and you'd refer to the delay in the committee receiving the paper. So just like to apologise for that. Um, as you said, there was a further late exercise commissioned and we felt it was important um, that the committee got a complete picture. Um, so the paper that you have in front of you this morning describes my department's response to January monitoring. Um, as you're aware, the monitoring exercise, um, which typically occurs three times a year, allows departments to realign its budget allocation on the basis of emerging need. Flexibility in budgetary management afforded to departments is normally limited, typically to facilitating the reallocation of small amounts without recourse to the Department of Finance or the Executive. However, given the need for departments to respond more quickly to emerging pressures, the executive has again agreed um, that flexibility could be given to reallocating non ring fence budgets to meet um, internal emerging pressures. The paper describes in some detail the easements, budget pressures, the reallocations that have been made and then further bids that have been made for additional funding. So I won't repeat the detail um, in these introductory remarks, but I will just briefly summarise for you the headline figures. In total, and rounded to the nearest million pounds, our Minister has approved the internal reallocation of 18 million of Resource Dale non-ring fence budget to fund emerging pressures. There is a reduced requirement of 105 million in respect of a number of COVID ring fence budgets for various schemes and initiatives, the most significant being 93 million in respect of the High Street Support Scheme. There are also bids across a number of COVID schemes totalling 39 million. And in addition to that, bids totalling 55 million have been submitted to DOF for COVID related initiatives to support economic recovery. The largest of these relates to three bids totalling 42 million to facilitate the extension of European funding into 2021 22 and beyond. Other bids relate to 7 million for loss of commercial, commercial research income in higher education and assistance to tourism accounts for 5 million to support recovery sorry for recovery support um, for strategic tourism assets so this brings the dfe covid related bids to 93 million inescapable non covid resource style bids have been made to dof for 34 million of this 31 million relates to cover required for expected credit losses from using financial transaction capital and the Finance Minister wrote to the Economy Minister yesterday to confirm the Treasury will fund the 31 million. A bid of 8 million has been made for higher education quality research, which will increase economic productivity, prosperity and tackle major societal challenges. So in total, um, bids to DOF for COVID and non-COVID from DFE are 135 million. If I move on to Capital Dale then, as a result of January monitoring, the Minister has reallocated 3 million of capital to cover departmental pressures um, and 1 million um, of a reduced requirement has also been submitted to DF, sorry, to DOF. Um, a separate capital bid has been made for £6 million pounds for Project Stratum and there is a reduced requirement of £12 million for financial transaction capital. This is due to a surrender of £10 million pounds from Tourism NI, as the funding is no longer required for the Game of Thrones project, as the investors have secured alternative finance. And there's also two million from Invest NI on financial transaction capital, and that's due to there being less demand in the market for that source of finance. Finally, DFE submitted AMI resource bids, totaling 202 million. 
62 million is in respect of the forecast position for student loans and 140 million um, to account for the High Street Voucher Scheme that will now be delivered in 2021-22. An AME Capital bid of 16 million has also been submitted in respect of student loans. Chair, that's a quick summary of the paper that you have in front of you. Joanna and I would be happy to do our best to answer any questions that you might have and to provide additional clarification and explanation. And of course, where we cannot give you precise or complete answers, we will be happy to write to the clerk with the necessary explanations. Useful overview. Um, I have just a couple of questions, that, um, and then we'll open up to members. I suppose the the um, the first one, and I suppose the most striking, um, is the the uh, reduced requirement in relation to the high street voucher scheme. Obviously, that that's a, a huge amount of money that was allocated in respect of that. Um, and it's can you explain why it's not now being used this financial year? Yes, um, certainly. Uh, so we had got 95 million um, uh, allocated to the High Street Voucher Scheme and we are we have a reduced requirement of 93 million. And the main reason for that reduced requirement is because of the increased restrictions um, and obviously the health situation. And, you know, there had to be a judgment call around when those in restrictions might be um, eased a bit. And I suppose eased enough to get the best economic benefit um, for the money within this scheme. Um, so, you know, we really just felt as a department that we would be better trying to focus on running this scheme early in the new financial year. Um, so, so therefore, um, the money is being surrendered now. We obviously have proposals to use that money um which which we have put um in, in January monitoring around in terms of um bids for for other things that, that we could use that funding on. But essentially the reason why that scheme has been deferred is the health reasons. Now that is not to say that um in taking the scheme forward um you, you know there there were some logistical challenges certainly around getting a reliable data set to use but that's not the main reason for the deferral. I would have is just, just in relation to actually using the money. Could it be used this financial year, put onto those um, prepay cards that we had heard described previously, and then be utilised in the next financial year so that the bid that had previously been made and allocated could actually be used this financial year? Because is there a guarantee or even a suggestion that the money might be available again in the next financial year when we don't have this same amount of COVID um, resource allocated to the <coughs> Um, well, I think sort of in terms of the logistics and the timing of when certain things happen, um, the treatment of that in terms of how it's accounted for is obviously governed by accounting standards. And whenever we were looking at this, um, we felt that we needed to push the scheme into the next financial year. So, you know, um, just to load the cards would not have been enough to say that we would have needed to um, account for that amount of money. You'll see within the paper, um, we are we have made an AME bid for 140 million. So that is to allow us um, to account for the scheme correctly in this financial year, but it's not resource dial money, um, which will be needed next year. Um, so there wasn't really a way around that um, to, to utilize the money for the high street scheme this year given the, the level of restrictions and really where we felt the trajectory would be. Okay, I'm not sure that, that, I, that I understand that. Can you maybe just explain a wee bit more about the, the bid that has been, or the Amy bid that has been made in relation yeah. to it? Yes, sure. Um, so we have made um, an Amy bid for 140 million. And um, what that is based on is um, a model where each adult would get hundred pounds each so obviously the initial money that had been allocated wouldn't have been enough um, to give um, each adult a hundred pounds each but the AME bid is based on that model it will obviously be subject to executive approval um, you know so so that will be a decision for the executive as to whether it wants to give a hundred pounds each or whether it will be a bit less to um, I suppose stay within the parameters of what was allocated this year. 
Okay, so in relation to that Amy bid, is that something that has been made then to the executive or to Treasury? It's been made to the executive. Okay. Um, and I, I guess then the, the question just remains in terms of the next financial year, are you um, confident that that bid will be um, realised? Um, I suppose I can't preempt an executive decision. Um, I do know that um, you know the executive are aware of the proposals here, um, and I suppose it will depend on the political will to allocate money to that. Um, I I think that um, you know it's 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 likely there will be more COVID funding coming from um, Treasury next year. And I know that the Department of Finance are also speaking to Treasury about um, being allowed to flex any potential underspends into next year as well. Okay, I, I suppose the concern that I would have and, and maybe other committee members can reflect on this themselves is that this funding not being utilised this year puts at risk the, the scheme actually being able to be operated in, in the next financial year. And obviously it's a very significant amount of money that has been allocated to that that is now... You know, potentially some of it's being handed back, and 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 then there's bids in relation to, to some of the the rest of it. Uh, I, I guess just in terms of, of using that amount of money and the potential for for underspend is is quite significant in in respect of that. Um, and just in relation to the the accounting of it, is has that something that has been explored to the fullest with DOF? Um, we have. In terms of the scheme and the money not being utilised, I mean, I think um, given where we are with the health restrictions um, and the likely impact that releasing these cards may have, um, you know, the decision was taken that um, that would not be the right thing to do. Um, as I've said, we have proposals here to utilise that money if the executive agrees. And, and I think given that, given that we have accepted where we are in terms of the health restrictions, you know, the, the right thing to do is to surrender this money um, so where it can be utilised elsewhere and put into the economy, maybe through other routes that, you know, that can happen. In terms of the accounting treatment, yes, um, we have looked at this very carefully and, um, you know, we also um, had conversations with the audit office about sort of how we would propose to treat this as well. Okay, um, thanks for that. And I guess the, the point I suppose I've been making in relation to it, obviously we completely understand the, the health restrictions that are in place at the minute and the impact that that has on in terms of the, the scheme being able to be used in this financial year. The, the proposal, I suppose, would be that it would be loaded up and used in, into the next financial year. Um, but that's something that we can pick up with the department in, in more detail. Um, Chair, sorry, just to confirm, the loading of the cards would not allow under the accounting treatment for it to be recognised as resource sale in the accounts in the next financial year. That's where the Amy bit comes in and it's all to do with the government accounting of it. So even the preloading of the cards would not be strong enough because there's still an action that needs to be done by the member of public to spend the money after that. So that's the point in which we can recognise that in the financial accounts as resource debt. Okay, no, thank you. I don't you. know whether that clarifies it. No, thanks for that. Um, I guess there's just a couple of other things that um, I wanted to pick up on. Um, <clears throat> If I maybe hand over to John O'Dowd first of all, and then I'll, I'll come back in myself. I just need to find my, my place in my notes. Go on ahead, John. <coughs> oh, John, I think you're on mute. John's on mute, yeah. Sorry, can you hear my Yep. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I just want to reflect on the other part of the AME bid, uh, which is in relation to student loans. I think this reflects the financial hardship that many families and uh, workers find themselves under at this time as a result of COVID. Um, as part of that, those student loan bids, has there been any thought or representations made to the Treasury in relation to compensating students uh, for th this year's um, 
financial hardship they've been through. Many students have, haven't had the, the experience that they were promised through no fault of, the, of anyone's COVID-19, but uh, the educational experience, the student experience hasn't been what uh, they would have expected. And when you look at the financial hardship that some students are under in relation to uh, paying rent for accommodation they can't stay in, etc., has there been any representation made to uh, the Treasury in those regards? Um, well, in, in terms of uh, student hardship, uh, DFE did get 1.4 million um, from you know an allocation from the executive, and the department also allocated 1.4 million. Um, so so you know there was an additional 2.8 million went into student hardship this year in recognition of the situation. Um, in preparing for January monitoring round, we did um, obviously in seeking bids ask was there a need to increase. Um, that fund and we were told no there is still funding available there um, w within that hardship fund if students wish to use it. Uh, I, I appreciate that Sean um, and I, I have serious concerns about the flexibility of the student hardship fund but this is a slightly different issue. This is the issue of students have paid fees uh, for a student experience which they haven't which hasn't been fulfilled uh, and I note that uh, representation has been made to Amy, which is to the Treasury, I understand, uh, for, for additional funds for student loans because families uh, and workers are facing considerable hardship as a result of COVID. The point I'm trying to raise is this. Has there been any consideration in seeking compensation for students who are paying fees for an experience they're not getting and paying rent for accommodation they're not using? Um, John, I am not aware um, whether there has or there hasn't in, in terms of that. So perhaps we could get the policy officials to follow up with you on that. If you could, please. And just finally, in relation to the, the voucher scheme, um, uh, if next year, next financial year, if that scheme goes ahead, uh, and the money's on the cards. If that money isn't spent within that financial year, will it be lost? Um, I suppose the details of the scheme are still being worked out. So I'm really just talking off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, I would think that we would want to time bind those cards. So, you know, not, not to give such a tight timeline that it makes it impossible for people to use, um, but, you know, time bound it so that we can make sure that the scheme and the budget can align and, and we understand you know where that money might be so i suppose the answer will be in the design of the scheme and to sort of make sure that the money isn't lost okay thank you thanks um sharon and jo joanna um sorry i just find what i wanted to go back to so sharon you uh referred in your remarks to um uh, finance having confirmed that treasury was going to meet a number of bids sorry could you just talk to those Certainly. Um, so those bids are set out in Appendix 2, Table 2, and it's the first um, section of those. Um, most most of um, the, the bids there, that's what I refer to. So it's expected credit losses. Um, so we have a number of bids in terms of expected credit losses. So this is um, where if you have a loan or you're using financial transaction capital, um, there's been a new accounting standard, IFRS 9, and it requires you to account under resource Dale for the money that you might expect to lose. Or equally, um, you'll see there's an Invest NI write-off on one of their loans. Um, so where there's a write-off, you need to account for that. Um, so as a result of COVID, um, you know, there have been implications, obviously, for this type of financing. And um, the Department for Economy, together with the Department of Finance, um, you know, sort of we were speaking to the Department of Finance and made a persuasive case that they would go to Treasury to ask that this could be covered under an implications, uh, um, an outworking of COVID. Um, so, so as a result, the Department of Finance have got agreement from Treasury that they will cover the, 30, the 31 million here. And you see, just in respect of the Invest NI, um, the, the Sustainable Poultry Litter Project, uh, it says it's an expected credit loss. Does that mean that that's not confirmed yet? Um, I think the amount of it isn't confirmed. They're still working through the details of that, but I 
you know, the, the best estimate is that it will be 10 million. And I think that loan was 10 million. So I don't think they, they, they expect to get anything back. That is, you know, that's actually a write off. Um, so it's an FTC write off that one. Okay, and, and then just, I suppose, finally for myself, before I hand over to some other members, in relation to the bids that are being made um, for COVID support schemes, so there, there's a, a few extra ones there other than what we already had, know have been allocated in relation to company directors and tourism and hospitality. Um, but we obviously have heard over the course of the past number of months from um, groups who are still excluded from some of those schemes is there any uh, consideration being given to additional schemes given the amount of funding that is potentially still available at the centre um, in respect of COVID um, allocations? So, for example, um, the, the newly self-employed scheme was obviously extended there last week to cover um, those who became self-employed more recently and potentially had um, less than 50% of their income from being self-employed. But there is still a gap in respect of those who became self-employed late in 1819 financial year and also for those who became self-employed this year who have, have not been able to access any um, additional support is there any consideration being given to the, the likes of those in respect of schemes um, and also we know that taxi drivers and coach operators haven't been able to access part b of the crbss so far because they're, they're not considered um, eligible for that, although they are very clearly in the supply chain of businesses that have been um, forced to close under the restrictions. So has any um, consideration been given to uh, additional supports? Um, I think in, in terms of any additional schemes or additional supports, um, I, I would prefer if the policy area could maybe get back to you on that. You know, sort of that hasn't been covered in terms of the work that we have done for January monitoring. Um, so I think just to give you a more complete and fuller answer, it would be better if um, somebody from that business area could come back to you on that. I appreciate that, Sharon. Thank you. Um, Gary. Um, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, uh, Sharon, for um, for for your uh, presentation. It was very useful. I, I suppose. Uh, sorry to go back to it, but it's to go back to this uh, EMA or annually managed expenditure. Um, initially, the minister for the economy put in a bid for um, 160 million. Um, it was back in November, whenever the finance minister had written out to his colleagues, 169 million for the high street voucher scheme. Um, she received 95 million, uh, and they were developing. Uh, well, I'm assuming they were developing a scheme on that basis. And, and you know, it is important that, um, and I and I recognise why the scheme has had to be held off because it would be very foolish at this minute in time to uh, roll out a voucher scheme when you know the town and city centres are all shut. Uh, so we need to make sure we time that right. But I suppose it's just it's interesting in terms of you'd say I suppose it's a political will. The difficulty being the Department for Economy clearly feels that um, the, the the bid for the 140 million they must feel that that's very much necessary to have a very effective scheme and to have the maximum impact. You know, do you think the Department for Finance uh, will uh, take that approach when putting it forward to the executive or? You know, is it solely an executive decision, or can the minister for finance decide? No, you know, I'm not willing to do that, and 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 I suppose stop that from going to the executive table. Um, Gary, thank you. I mean, you are right. The Department for Economy does consider that this scheme would really um give a good economic impact um to the whole economy through the high street if this scheme was taken forward, and the minister, you know, is committed to seeking additional funding for it. Um, in terms of the mechanics of that, um, you know, I think this is something that's been aired at the executive is my, my understanding. So, you know, I, 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 I'm unsure, but I, I think this is more, uh, well, the monitoring rounds are always, and the allocation of funding are always um, a, a decision for the executive collectively. Um, whether the Minister of Finance might not put a bid forward or not, I can't really answer for him or his department. 
No, thanks for that. And I, I obviously don't envy uh, the decisions of some of the executive ministers because they all uh, come with their various priorities and everybody has their own ideas because uh, some people will feel that you know, the high street voucher scheme may not have the impact that it would have. I think that um, many people, I can only go from some of the contacts that I've had from constituents, uh, both from the business perspective and from the individual, they're really, I suppose, looking forward to it, uh, all for various different reasons, but I think uh, the High Street would very much uh, welcome it as well. Uh, if we just go on, uh, in, in Appendix 3 and Table 2, it talks about uh, Dell ring-fenced COVID-reduced requirements, uh, and there's a number of schemes now, I think it totals about, you know, well, four, well three or four million. Uh, it talks about, you know, new apprenticeship initiatives, re re retain your apprentice and training for success. That money, so, so that money has been handed back. Is that, I'm assuming that's, it's saying COVID, we just, but I'm assuming is that because they just couldn't do it because of the restrictions? Is that the reason why the money has been handed back? Yeah, it absolutely is because of the restrictions. Um, because um, for, for some of those, um, the for existing apprenticeships, um, the, there was um, initiatives there to encourage employers to bring existing uh, apprentices back. Um, but because of the restrictions, those apprentices are furloughed now. And also there's one there about um, new apprenticeships. Um, and, and obviously just because of the restrictions, that hasn't been possible. Thanks for that. I think that you know, going forward, it is going to be very difficult to manage the pressures that we have, deal with COVID, but also, I suppose, look forward to the future because you know we're all having conversations around city deals and the future fund, and you know, moving towards some of the things that we we, we should have been, I suppose, on the ground and rolling at this stage. So, uh, it's a fine balance to try and manage. Um, what hasn't been able to happen this year allowed to happen next year but also allow for those new things so it's a very difficult task but thanks for providing uh, some information today I much appreciate it thank you thanks Gary um, Stuart can I bring oh. can I bring Stuart into the spotlight please <coughs> okay thank you uh, apologies I've had some very uh, technology problems this morning and uh, just didn't quite catch the beginning of your question. But just in, in, in broad terms, um, while I appreciate, and you've just explained to Gary, for example, why uh, some apprenticeship money will be returned. Um, and that's that's not unnatural given the circumstances that we're in, but can you qualify for me about two things? First of all, at the end of January, um, what the total surrender for the department will be, uh, and secondly, where you expect this to be in terms of final surrender by the end of the financial year? Yes. Um, question. Yeah, sorry. Just for, Joanna, do you have those figures to hand in terms of the um, total surrender? I just know we've sort of presented as COVID and non COVID. Um, for the, uh, from January monitoring round, it's yeah. 105 million. 105. Hundred and five million R Dell, one million C Capital Dell, and ten million FTC. Okay, but that's a hundred and five from January monitoring. Yes, one hundred and five for Resource Dell. Resource okay. Dell. Uh, so in total, uh, it will be hundred and sixteen million. So that is split up as a hundred and five Resource Dell. Mm -hmm. 10 million financial transactions capital and 1 million capital Dell. Okay. And then by the end of the financial year, your expectation? Or is it too soon to say? Well, at this stage... Sorry, question. Sorry, go on ahead, Joanna. At this stage, January monitoring is our most up-to-date position, yeah. and that is the position that we would see. We have given up anything that we expect to underspend at this stage. Okay. So therefore, between now and the end of the financial year, it, it would not be unreasonable to consider that there would be a further uh, surrender of funds. What, what planning is the department doing to ensure, for example, um, the very necessary uh, COVID schemes uh, in support of closed businesses and company connectors, all of those schemes that we're aware of? Uh, what, if any, consideration is um, to um, both maximise those schemes, in other words, to, to re-push those out into the community to make sure you've got everybody, 
And secondly, this, this is possibly a policy area to ensure that um, many, if not all, of these things have fallen very far short. Not for criticism, but they just have fallen very far short for actually delivering real support to people that, that it's been uh, rolled out to. What consideration is there to looking to see what may be returned, and instead of returning it, bring a one-off bonus top-up to each of those games? Um, Stuart, just in terms of our January monitoring position, I mean, as we sit here today, that is our best estimate as to what where we think we're going to come in um, by the 31st of March across our areas of expenditure. I think um, we've talked about it at the committee before and we do have concerns about the very, very tight ring fencing um, of the schemes. Um, and as you've said, you know, we're, we're, we're now living in an environment where it's very, very difficult to predict um, you know, what's going to happen next week, never mm. mind by the 31st of March. So I think for some of those schemes, it's probably not unreasonable to think that there may be some money that um, may not be spent, but we can't foresee that now. We, you know, we, we, we have given our best estimate. I think we have um, approached the Department of Finance several times, and I know our minister has raised this in the executive um, to see can some of that ring fencing be lifted in a way that would allow us if we had underspends in one area to divert it um, into another area but you know the, as we sit here the ring fencing still remains um but you know we are we continue to request that and um, but but it will be a risk as as we get towards the end of the year yeah, because we, we did ask quite some time ago. The uh, minister did reply to say she was making efforts to see what she had done to venal funds between those ring fence accounts to, to, to maximise them. I think it would be a very unforgiving public uh, and particularly a very unforgiving community um, that saw money being returned to the Treasury um, and not having been spent locally um, because people genuinely have suffered all the way from our taxi drivers right to our company directors. Um, ju just finally, a question in relation to the voucher scheme. Um, when did you take the decision that it wasn't practical, and I think it, it made more the right decision, it wasn't practical to proceed in this financial year with the scheme? And could you outline for us the amount of planning that had been made up to that point? And indeed, is there a unit continuing to plan uh, for the delivery of those potential cards to the funds become available? Um, Stuart, yes, there, there is a team working on this um, to to rule it out and um, to make sure subject funding that it will be delivered in the next financial year. In terms of when those decisions were taken, um, again, sort of in terms of very, very specific dates, the policy team would be better to advise you. But, um, you know, I have been involved in some of the discussions in terms of the financial numbers and they've been taken this month um, because obviously the increased restrictions has impacted on, on those decisions. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, um, Stuart. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, in relation to Appendix 3, the Dale Ring Fence uh, schemes, can we just talk, talk about a number of those, possibly, please? Um, the company directors um, is, has been launched has there been money paid out on, on that scheme yet? The company director? Um, I'm unsure. Um, we would need to come back to you on that. The, the company director one hasn't launched yet. No, uh, there's been no money paid out on it yet. Yeah. So you're predicting uh, 40 million for that. Is that right? I suppose yes. that's the upper limit. The upper limit on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. The hotel sector. It's something I've been pushing on for a long time. Hotels have been lying vacant for now for virtually all of last year and are under immense pressure. Do they come under this tourism and hospitality scheme or is there a separate bid for that? 
the, the that's the tourism and hospitality scheme. That is the bid that has been increased to 25.5 million, and that would um, cover the hotel sector. Has that been approved by, by finance then? No, it's, it's going forward in this January monitoring um, for the funding to be approved. Okay. The wet pubs has been approved. We are all aware of that just very recently. Um, yeah. The recently self-employed scheme, has that been approved? Yes. Yes, that money has been approved, so we have no bid requirement there. Right. Right. My next point is the CRB SAS scheme. Now that, that's extended out to cover the existing lockdown period. Does your budget figure of forty seven million does that cover that extension, which really will be a I suppose another reissue of checks to the to basically the same people? Is that does that cover all of that? Yes, yes. That figure covers us up to the sixth of February. Up to where, sorry? I think it's the sixth of February. Of February, which isn't long, yeah, just a few weeks. Yeah. And the bed and breakfast scheme is something I've been pushing for as well. That's still not approved, is that right? No, that, that is approved. Is um, it? So we have no bid requirement there. Yeah. The, the, bid, the, bid, the bid is approved. Um, I'm not sure whether the, the scheme is The actual is scheme, right. sorry. The actual yeah. scheme, yes. Yeah. They have been approved. Yeah, it has. Okay. I think there are issues. I don't... Yeah, sorry. Are you aware of issues about getting the mechanism right in, in delivery of that scheme? Is that right? So it doesn't have to be aware of that. I, I mean, there is a policy area develop, developing these schemes, so um, you know, I, I'm not close to the detail of where they are in terms of that specific development. But you know, we can get somebody to come back to you on that. No, yeah, I understand. To be fair, it's not. These are not mani managing that scheme as such, are you? Yeah, no. no. Um, right. You talked about tourism and I returned funds. Briefly, could you just elaborate a bit more on that, please? Funds that have yes, been returned. Certainly. So the biggest amount that has been returned um, from Tourism MI is 10 million financial transaction capital, and that was where we had secured money. And they had a client that's developing um, a Game of Thrones tourist attraction, and they couldn't get um, finance from the private sector because of COVID. But as time has gone on, um, and again, just um, there in January. Um, the client has now been able to avail of finance from the private sector, so there's no need um, for the public sector to provide that £10 million. Um, the other area where tourism has returned money is in their holidays at home voucher scheme. And again, it's very, very similar the reasons um, you know, to the high street um, stimulus scheme where it just wouldn't be appropriate um, to start to run that scheme. You know, hotels are closed and um, just to suppose the time is not right. And we're hoping, I suppose, to get a, a better bang for a buck in terms of the economic stimulus um, if that scheme is taken forward early next year. Um, so they're the two main items. I think there was another 250000 that was returned in terms of their marketing budget. But, you know, that was small by comparison to the other areas. Okay, great. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, John Stewart. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, Joanna, for um, the information and presentation so far. Um, just to return, firstly, to the voucher scheme. Sorry to cover old ground. Um, it was obviously talked about, and while there was a little bit of negativity, I think overall, every party was supportive of it, and the business sector, particularly the independent sector and retail, were very, very welcoming of that. And it was really seen as, as part of a linchpin, I suppose, of economic recovery. And while I'm sympathetic, I suppose, now that it can't be ruled out, given the climate that we're in, I just listening to the language and even the conversation about we might have to look at other potential opportunities for economic stimulus instead of that, is that still part of the, the linchpin of economic recovery for the department? Um, and given the uncertainty about what financial money will be there, are you going to put a package in place that will be able to be ruled out regardless if you get the full amount or slightly less? So I think um, just to be clear in terms of um, other economic stimulus, you know, we have made bids in January monitoring round that um, would support the economy, but the money would be spent by the end of 
of March. The issue with the high street voucher scheme is it really needs to fall into next year. Um, so, so, so that's what um, you know we have planned on. And in terms of that, the amount that we, I mean, if if we don't, you know, if we're not allocated 140 million next year, the executive decide there are other priorities and you know they can't give us the full 140 million then the scheme will be designed around fitting the budget that's available okay um so it does sign from that that there's still a strong will in the department to see this scheme rolled out and i think we'll betide any party that was to go against that in the executive and not support that scheme so with that in mind i think i'd be very confident there would be I'd like to see it directed towards independent retail, particularly in those sectors that have been most affected. But given now that you've got that time, um, and hopefully in the next couple of months we'll see um, the infection rate subside and a return to normality, can we get assurances then that this scheme will be ready to rock the day that it's funded? Because when we, were talk, when we heard from the Minister back in October, November, there was even talk that this could be rolled out in early January. Um, situations have changed, we are where we are, but you know, I think there's a frustration that we hear about these schemes and then when it comes to it, we have to wait another three, four, five months to see them rolled out. So will this be ready to, to go? Well, I think, I mean, as I've said before, I'm not working on the policy team, so I wouldn't want to commit someone to something that isn't within my area. But, you know, we do have a team working on this. Okay. Um, there is uh, absolute will um, to take it forward. And I think you, you quite rightly have referred to some schemes that have maybe taken, um, you know, a bit longer to um, mobilise. And I think the benefit here is that we actually have, you know, sometimes the schemes are announced and then the detail needs to be worked out. Whereas with this one, we do have a team, they are working on it, okay. um, you know, and I, I do know that, you know, really good progress has been made on it. Okay, that's good to hear. I look forward to seeing that. Talking about another scheme that has been delayed, though, and that's that of the directors, um, so the company director support scheme. We heard back in October, November, gave the minister that potentially that could have been ruled out before Christmas. Um, it's now January. I appreciate people were going to be off over Christmas, but where are we with getting that out? If it's much more delayed, I mean, is that going to be impacted in the budget if we head towards the end of the financial year and the money hasn't been paid out, for example? So is, is that nearing completion? Because people are asking me, and I'm sure other elected reps on a daily basis, where that is. I think, um, you know, again, look, it's for the policy, and I don't want to keep sort of trying to put that up as a standard line. Um, but, you know, I can give you a bit of background as to where I think it is. Um, I think, again, that's a scheme that certainly there's been a lot of work done on. The fact that, um, you know, we are bidding for it here in the January modelling, certainly, um, you know, we believe that this scheme will be launched and the money will be paid out by, by the end of March. So, you know, that's our signal that, yes, we do believe um you know but 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 in terms of an actual launch date for that um you know that's not within my remit okay i'll maybe give a question then this <laughs> because of my apologies i appreciate some of this is policy and there is that overlap yeah one hopefully Sorry. you can answer and that was what i think Stuart dixon was trying to talk about but we couldn't really hear him and that would be that it would be lamentable if, if we saw a sum in excess of 110 million pound returned unspent where it could have been rolled out to areas in need and we talk about excluded businesses and businesses that haven't been able to avail of that um, can you talk a little bit more about even the 105 million in what way is that ring fence and how could that not be used to top up for example or broaden the self-employment scheme um, the company director scheme the crbs part to, uh, part b uh, i just can't get, really get my head around that i'm sure the public can't sure. about how we hand back a whack without yeah. actually spending it what we need to yeah so whenever the money is allocated in the monitoring rounds, it's very tightly ring fenced. So for instance, the high street voucher scheme could only be spent on the high street voucher scheme. Um, so we do not have within the Department for Economy, we do not have the ability to say, well, do you know what? Um, we know we're going to underspend there. And with these other very pressing and very real pressures, um, so we don't have the ability where funding is ring fenced like that. The company director scheme is ring fenced to company directors. Um, you know, all those individual schemes are ring fenced amounts only for those schemes. So we cannot take the decision to simply move money around. Um, and that is, um, you know, what we have been talking to the Department of Finance about and what our minister has also raised um, to say, you know, there needs to be some flexibility. Now, you know, I totally understand that um, the exec it's the executive needs to decide where priorities are. 
Um, but, you know, some of those schemes, so for instance, if you take tourism as an example, you know, we might have several ring fence pots for tourism. Um, and I suppose what we're asking for is the flexibility where if one tourism scheme was going to overspend and we could usefully reallocate um, and underspend from tourism, you know, could we have the flexibility to do that? But as we said at the minute, we don't have that flexibility. And I suppose my concern would be, you know, January monitoring is really the last opportunity to, um, you know, sort out um, the, the, the budget. Um, so, so there wouldn't be an opportunity beyond this to reallocate. Um, so if we were underspending somewhere, then, you know, that money um, would be unutilised at the year end. Really valid point about that, and, and the rule. And I think it was actually our economy committee colleague John O'Dyer. I don't know if he's still on the line, but I think back to maybe May or June when he talked about throwing the rule book in the bin for the duration of COVID nineteen. And perhaps there's never a true word spoke when it comes to the ring fencing of money. I think it would be deeply frustrating, and I can see the sense of frustration in your voice about that. If we can't get the situation where we can allow flexibility in the spending rather than handing back the treasury and that money being lost, we're in an economic war footing. And I think it's it's. It's essential that we be able to spend this money where it can be directed fastest in the current financial year. So whatever needs to be done, and maybe it can be highlighted, we, we lobby executive colleagues or whoever needs to do that to start ticking these boxes to make this happen. But thank you. Thanks. Um, sorry, can I just go back to the, the, the Amy money and the, the high street voucher thing again? Um, apologies for that, but <laughs> I, I'm just trying to understand that I'm not an accountant, so um, the technicalities of it are maybe a wee bit beyond me. But see, in terms of the bid that's made, the £140 million, um, and it says in, in the, the pack that um, the scheme announcement in the current financial year will create an obligation requiring provision in the, the next financial year. Um, so, in terms of that, the uh, conversations that there's been had with, with the audit office in the relation to the the, um, the accounting for that, why can it not be, you know, if it's created the obligation for the next financial year, why can it not be loaded up as such and put on and used next financial year? Um, Joanna, do you want to pick this up? Yeah. Or? Basically, it's um, whenever you create the expectation, it's where it falls from. In, it's, it's to do with government accounting, actually, because a provision for government accounting, so that's the Amy that we refer to, that scores in Amy. When you actually make the physical payment from a budgeting perspective, that scores in what we would refer to as resource Dell next year. And the resource Dell is what we would need next year to make the payments. And I know it, it is really confusing, it's a part of government accounting um, that that is, but it's basically when you make uh, that commitment, it scores an Amy. When you actually make the payment or act, you know it actually happens, the event actually happens, that's when you need the Ardale, which is what we would be asking the executive for in a bid. Okay, so uh, if you are making a bid for Amy now for the next financial year, is Amy in this financial year, but it's Dell? Amy's in, in this financial year and our Dell is in next financial year. So Amy allows it to be shown in our account this financial year as a provision because we have made a commitment and the our Dell allows us to make the actual payments in the next financial year. Okay, so is that like a speculative bid? an extent in terms of that for this financial year? No, they're, they're, two, they're, they're two separate budget pots, but basically you're aiming in it for this is non-cash. The Ardell is the cash bit, whereas some other Amy bid that you would see on the committee would be actually cash related. So if, another example would be if you had a, a court case and you were going to you know, you were going to lose, it was more probable that you were going to lose and there was going to be large damages, you would provide for that in your accounts under Amy. And then when the payment was finalised and you were making the payment, it would be in our day in, in the next financial year. That's the best that it could use as a, an everyday sort of okay. comparator. Can I just ask why does it need to be made in this budget year if it's for the next financial year? Why does it have to be reflected in this year's um, because budget? 
under accounting regulations, you would need to make this a provision because if your intention is or you launch this scheme prior to the 31st of March, then you need to show that in your financial accounts. Okay. Would it be possible for you to share that the, the accounting rules around that with the committee just yes. so that we can get a proper understanding of that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Can we bring Sinead in? To... Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, Ergen. Still morning, I think. Just afternoon. So, um, thank you very much uh, for your detail um, of, of, of where the money is and where the money isn't. And I suppose what it really highlights is when you make this to begin with, there has to be nearly an assurity that you can actually spend them. Uh, uh, and, and that's where we get into the position that we actually have to hand back. And, and to be perfectly honest, um, that High Street voucher was, was dicey from the very, very beginning. Uh, and I raised that, that it was a vulnerable uh, scheme that, that could run into difficulties. Uh, and, uh, and we said that from day one once it was uh, presented to, to the committee. But anyway, um, you, you mentioned, Sharon, that there were other proposals and how to spend that money. Now, I, I get the ring spent and I get all of that. You can't move it out of one scheme and another scheme. But you did say that there were other potential links of spending that money. I mean, I, all of us around that committee table uh, have, have uh, talked to constituents that haven't had any money at all, haven't had any support, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to do I brought up one cohort, uh, and that's the students who are um, actually experiencing real difficulties around the ability to pay for accommodation that they're legally tied into, particularly within the private sector. The universities themselves have got some movement with the whole of residents and, uh, um, uh, 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 and um, you know, accommodation under there. We are under their uh, responsibility, but the private sector hasn't. Has any consideration been given at all to make any inroads in how to support our student population in this most difficult times? I mean, it seems outrageous that we've been handing back money uh, that can't be spent. In. And, and I understand the difficulties uh, and the lack of flexibility on them, but surely there is a way of our mechanism of, of looking at uh, enhancing maybe an existing student support scheme that is already there. Now, the hardship scheme, we have problems with the hardship scheme. We, we've written to the Department uh, for Economy around those um, problems, and students are very reluctant sometimes to even make a request into those schemes. But uh, there's very few days that go past that I don't have um, a, a contact made in my office regarding student hardship. Is there any possibility that we can get money to those students? Now, before the end of the year, uh, and some of that money that perhaps can't be spent in other areas. Um, Sinead, um, thank you for the question there. But in, in, you know, in terms of a substantive answer to that, you know, it would be for the higher education policy area. Um, as I said to John, you know, we we did um, seek bids in terms of this uh, the hardship fund. Um, in terms of January monitoring, but we were assured that there was sufficient funding there um, for, for any request. So, you know, I can't really go, give you much more detail beyond that, um, but if, if you would like some more, we can certainly get the policy officials in higher education um, to come back to you. Why are you phoning me? Okay, and, uh, and in relation in the last uh, presentation that you gave us, Sharon, you expressed concern over um, the European funding, um, particularly, uh, I suppose, I'm concerned about the innovation piece um, in relation to uh, Invest MI. Um, have we got any clarity from, from the last time you spoke to us? 
Um, well, you'll see, Sinead, um, from our papers that we have uh, three proposals in terms yeah. of the European Fund and the total, I think it's 42 and a half million. Yeah. Um, so we are putting those forward. Um, and, you know, again, we have been trying to engage at official level. And I know the minister has engaged um, at ministerial level about this. And I think we would be hopeful that, um, you know, we would receive funding for those bids. So I think particularly for the Invest NI one, um, you know, it is quite critical. Um, but there's 16 million pounds there that if this is funded in January monitoring, this will give Invest NI, um, you know, it will allow them to move their ERDF funding into next year. And I think that's really important because, you know, that there is no resolution as we sit for mm -hmm. um, replacement funding and that will at least give some breathing space to allow that work to be done um you know sort of come to, come to some hopefully good conclusions um so i think if we get those bids fund, funded i i think that that does allow invest ni to continue on with that area of work um while we seek to get a proper solution yeah and i think that's really important um, in, in the short term, and we need a long term solution around it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sinead. Um, I think that, that's, that's all of our, our questions have, for now. And sure, if there's anything additional, we can send it through to yourselves if that would be okay with you. Yes, that, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Um, so. Chair, um, it, it might be useful to, to write to the Minister, FMD, FM and the Finance Minister just about the issue of ring fencing. It, it does seem to have come up a lot. Uh, and just to seek clarity about how ring fencing around COVID um, pot funded schemes works, because what officials were, were saying was it, it's a, a very definite, that's COVID scheme X, therefore it can only be spent on that, and that's how the ring fencing works. Whereas you might have a shortfall in COVID scheme Y, but you cannot move COVID scheme X into it. It's just maybe to get a better understanding of whether there's any possibility of flexibility around that for that COVID funding, um, if members are content just to get that clarity. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I don't know what it was, but I'll agree. It's all right. <laughs> okay. Clarity around ring fencing. Oh yes, that would be helpful. It'd be nice to know who we need to lobby. I mean, what pr what process needs to be changed to, to get that flexibility? Okay, so members of content will move on to um, matters arising, and there's a fair few of them. So, yes. um, we'll try and get through them. Um, Six point one then, page twenty nine of your pack is a statement from the minister in relation to ESF. The minister stated that DFE has received 100 million per annum across structural and competitive funds over the lifetime of these programmes. This is from when the minister was in with me on the 16th, and we had asked for just her remarks so that we could get an understanding of the figures. Um, the minister has stated all of the current ERDF and ESF budget is currently committed to projects and continue to be spent until exhausted. ESF projects have currently funded in case until March 2022 and are managed by DFE um, directly. The spending review indicated an allocation of 220 million would be made available across the UK as a replacement for structural funds and that amounts to an allocation of 11 million for um, us here in the north, which is um, there has also been no clarity around activities and criteria. So this is obviously something that we've discussed there now. Um, and it's something that we will continue to raise, and I'm sure um, other ministers and executives will be doing so as well in terms of um, discussions with the British government. So it's to note, unless there's any comments. Thank you. Um, 30, then, or sorry, at 6.2, at page 30 of your pack, there is a ministerial response in relation to maintaining and developing air connectivity. It is in response to um, a letter that we had written to the minister following our meeting with the um, representatives of the airports on the 8th of December. Um, the minister's highlighted her role in securing £2 million to fund market support to be delivered by Tourism Ireland. The Minister notes that under the protocol, the North will remain aligned to EU rules for customs, VAT and excise while remaining part of the UK customs territory. This means the North will not be able to avail of duty-free um, for movements between here and Britain and also between here and the EU. The Minister has written to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster on the 30th of November in relation to concerns. 
uh, in relation to this, um, the Minister also agrees that removal of APD would be a considerable boost to the local economy and that APD is an unfair tax that should be addressed at a, a national level. So the Minister has also made representations to the British Government on those matters. Um, again, it's to note unless members have any. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, does this, can this be shared with most people we met? Yes, absolutely. I know it's, it's been discussed, we'll but I think that. it would be yeah. useful maybe sent to them just in terms of follow-up. Chair, we go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. Just since that last meeting as well, Chair, with the airports, is there any update on any of those routes that were lost to fly B? I know some have been replaced by Logan Air and things. Any updates on any new ones? We, new haven't had, we, we get a, a regular update from the airports. Nothing has come through subsequent to that meeting. Okay. I suspect that's because, been because of the Christmas period. So I would hope that those would start coming through sort of this week, next week. As soon as we get anything, we let members know. There's also talk with the, the potential for Fly B to make a comeback. I think some reason talk of buying it. Whether yeah, those so someone are... may now have acquired rights to the name. Yeah, I don't know what the um, are. And there was some Emirates. talk about, um, I'm not, not sure how it would work, but, but a limited route network okay. onto that name again. So Let's keep an eye, we'll keep an eye on that one. Um... 6.3 then, page 32 of your pack. Um, there's a response from the Minister about the student loan company application process. We had agreed to write to the Minister about the arrangements for Irish passport holders. The Minister stated there's an arrangement between the student loans company and HMPO where the UK passport holders are able to submit their passport details on application forms rather than including their original passport documents. Um, it extends only to UK passport holders and non-UK passport holders may continue to provide original passport, um, birth certificate, adoption certificate, etc. In, in the normal way. The Minister has indicated that the Department's Equality Unit has stated that there's no Section 75 implications and the facility has been introduced to allow technology to speed up processing applications where applicable. Um, so Unless anybody has any additional comments. Can I give another one, Chair? Yeah, go ahead, John. I'm losing sound, so I'm not sure if it's from my side or your side, but in regards to this matter, I have a number of areas, two areas of concern. One, I don't think there's anything to stop uh, the, the use of the Irish passport or seeking permission from uh, the Dublin government in relation to our access to the Dublin government in relation to the use of the Irish passport. And secondly, I would like to see the quality screening exercise that was carried out in regards, which allows the department to say that there's no equality issues in in, in regards to this matter. Uh, I'd like a copy of that equality screening exercise, please. We can ask for that, Chair. Okay. Mm. Members, mm. Consent? Mm. okay. So moving on then to six point four at page thirty-four of your pack is a response from the minister in relation to the student, student sorry student hardship fund. And the committee agreed to write to the Minister about the Student Hardship Fund, asking that the criteria for the fund be relaxed and the application process simplified. The Minister has indicated that the process is already minimal and cannot be reduced further. Um, uh, if members have looked at the um, supporting documentation, there, there are still a, a considerable number of hoops for students to, to go through in relation to being able to access this money and in the, the guidance from the department it contains stuff like um, there needing to be counselling on money management to ensure that the assistance uh, provided from sports funds is not wasted. <coughs> I don't think that those things are particularly appropriate in the current context. Yeah, I think that that's one of the issues that potentially the, the system was designed um, with a number of different kind of contexts in mind around uh, young people maybe not having experience in money management and so on, and it, it isn't really um, therefore recast for COVID. Um, so it, it, it depends on how members want to take that forward. Um, um, I think that there's a point in this in terms of not all students are young people. You know, students come from all age ranges and uh, background. And one of the presentations, anybody who was at the students' meeting pre-Christmas, there, there was a number of students who were in relationships, had children, were running family budgets, running family homes, etc. So they, they're more than capable of running budgets. But the thing that concerns me about this is this. Pre-Christmas, there was around £4 million left in this city. Uh, and given the amount of correspondence, I'm sure all MLA can save about the hardship students are facing, it would appear that the fund isn't as accessible accessible as it should be for students. 
And one of the questions I actually asked, meant to ask during the last presentation was, if the student hardship fund is not spent in this one answer of the year, is it lost? Can we find that out as well? Thank you. Sorry, can, can I come in there as well? Chair? Sure. Yeah, uh, in relation to the student hardship fund, uh, I would ag agree with what uh, John was saying there. That we had issues in and around that, and, and kind of answered it, and really address any of those. However, um, in relation to student hardship, we, we know students are paying out for accommodation. They're tied into accommodation and contracts with uh, the private sector, uh, and and they're not using it because go to university, they can't go to their their area. You know, they, they, these students don't have this money. They have no ability to make this money. They have no ability to earn this cash in order to pay it. And yet, um, there is no help or support mechanism in order for to to subsidise um, either their rent or to get them released from these uh, from these contracts, these leasing contracts. And I really do feel that you know that's where the student hardship is actually at, uh, and it's for all students. They shouldn't be paying for accommodation that they can't use at this particular time. And, and I'm not even going near the fees either, because you know some of them are. Are, are having very, very little uh, screen time, never mind any face-to-face -face, um, uh, 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 training or, or um, you know, any of their any of their coursework at all. It seems to be, you know, I'm, I, and that's not. I'm not trying to. Um, put an onus on, on the universities either. I know this is difficult times for all, but really the quality um, of their experience is so, so poor, and yet they're getting no reduction of costs, and the burden is still on them, and it's still on their parents as well, for those that are living back at home. So they're paying, the parents are, are, are doubly paying, you know, if they can afford to, they're paying for their child being back at home, and they're also paying for accommodation that they're not in, or those that don't have that parental backup, are having to um, uh, take this burden on. It is really causing mental torture and strain on these young people, and there is no value in it. And we uh, should be looking at it. It's in the portfolio of the Department for Economy, and they need to look at solutions in and around this. Um, yeah. Chair, we, we do. Um, Chair, there, there's there's also the, the 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 very difficult and core issue about private contracts um, between students and landlords. The, the department isn't in a position to interfere there. You you would have to seek um, to legislate around intervening on that, and I'm not entirely sure that the the power lies um, with the department to be able to do that. But it's something we can explore. Uh, but as I say, there's there's an item further on. It might give members a bit more um, background to on, on what the universities are doing as well. We have a few papers in there. Okay. Yeah. So it's six point five, then page thirty six um, of your practice response from the department about legislation monitoring dashboards. Um, sorry, the legislation monitoring yeah. dashboard for the energy SR. So it was issues that were raised at the um, meeting on the sixteenth when the minister and the permanent secretary were here about um, legislation pertaining to the um, EU exit. So the response indicates that issues are more likely to be operational than legislative and further technical dialogue um, is required. So it's to note, and we'll probably get an update in relation to the yeah. Brexit issues. If it's comfort, it. Chair, everything is still working. And, and the, <laughs> the, the agreements that cover everything still working. It's just the technical discussion about how you put that on paper and, and technical detail is still to be done, but th there doesn't seem to be any issue around everyone accepting it still needs to work. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, 6.6 .6 then, page 37 of your pack. There's a response from the Department of Bike Business Support Scheme. Um, at our meeting on the 25th of November, we discussed the business support schemes and requested an update about how much has been paid on it under Part A and Part B. Obviously, these figures have moved yeah, on considerably at this point. Um, and we also asked up for an update about the newly self-employed scheme. So these um, responses are a little bit out, out of date. Um, so. Chair, what we've had subsequently from the department actually um, gives us a more recent picture, but obviously because this was a response, we needed to bring it to committee, but um, it's 
it was drafted, I think, before um, Christmas. So it's it's yeah. really out of date. I think the, the, the date on it's the 13th. Yeah, it's it's very so, much out of date. If members are content to note, Chair, I think we would. Yeah, I think we welcome the fact as well that the CRBSS scheme is um, is following through on the previous applicants. I think, and that has been very positive that people don't have to reapply again. I think that has been good. And I note the point as well about having a um, a letter of support there from your accountant. It's not. Uh, necessary, but it's it's advisable really. So I got it does help to speed up the process, yeah. and I think that's good. And you know, it clarifies that at least some people were getting upset because they had to go and do that. And we appreciate obviously it could be a cost, but it does help to you know to to undermine or <laughs> underline their their business and gives it further you know verification that they. Uh, have a business and that it's you know it's worthy of support. So I think we we welcome all those points of clarification. The taxi issue still seems to be rattling on, and I'm sure you are all aware of that. Yeah. Um, they got that, and some of them have got the money. We still have some people still haven't got it. I've had constituents on to me this week about this the fifteen hundred pounds that they're expecting, which isn't a lot of money. Some of them still haven't received that money, which I think is is not acceptable, and. Um, then they keep being referred to self-employed income support scheme, which does um, is, I suppose, applicable to a number of them, but a number of them isn't. And then there was this problem they have with the insurance, where they cancelled the insurance because they had no business, or little or none, then they were not eligible. So there are still outstanding issues there that need to be addressed by the Department of Infrastructure. So I think we should maybe perhaps go back to the Department of Infrastructure and trying to get some more clarification on that issue, and urge the need to to get the payments out for those outstanding cases for the the fifteen hundred pounds, which I understand was mainly for meeting COVID requirements. Yeah, um, and also Peter, if we could ask about the new self-employed scheme because the closing date extended to the fifth of February. Yes, but you would hope that people who've already applied wouldn't have to wait until so the closing the date would to get start. Paid, it's so probably worth checking to see how that's going to work. That particular point as well. Chair, can I just comment on a couple of the points? Gordon's right about it's great to see that scheme extended under the Invest in ICBRSS scheme, both parts A and parts B. Still getting a lot of questions about when that payment's going to be made for those that have already been successful. In theory, it should just be a of a transaction. There's no processing involved because they've already met the criteria. So <coughs> it would be nice if a, if a press release could come out from Vesta now the department to say, don't worry, it's coming, rather than us having to front that up and try and get the answers, because to date there aren't any. I know from contact and in invest about an application recently, they also highlighted some of those who are potentially in part B previously mm -hmm. are maybe now eligible for right. the LRSS. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they, they need I think there needs to be a wee bit of communication mm -hmm. there between invest to and the applicants and yeah. we have to make sure that people are being put over to the scheme that they're eligible for. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of confusion and that's the feedback we're getting um, from from stakeholders as well as is, is more clarity and more detailed communication on how that's going to work because people are confused where they may have applied as you say to one scheme initially and now they're actually eligible for another um so yeah we can we can take that up with the department about getting getting more publicity yeah. could we ask that question to you then when that second tranche will be paid if they have met the criteria give us a firm date even even a period of dates where they'll be processing the payments yeah. um certainly it's good that it's been if you if you weren't eligible for another grant, say the LRSS, and you've been pushed towards now Part A, they will backdate that, which I don't think which yeah. was a was a real concern. So that's, yeah, it'd be that's nice to get some clarity on that. And Gordon's also right about the letter of accountant. I did an application for a chap yesterday who wasn't really computer literate, and the first response you get is please provide a letter from your accountant. Now, if you read into the detail quite far down, it's, it's not essential. But it's quite clear that application will be prioritised if the letter from the accountant comes in. Um, just so happened that he did. I again, if I had to tie it up for him, so a lot of people in a lot of those sectors that that's targeting just don't have <coughs> accountants because of the turnover that they're on. Um, I do understand, though, there has been some progress on people being able to get, um, if you like, identification that they are a genuine claimant through HMRC. 
um, where apparently you can you can contact them now and they're willing to give you the sorts of paperwork you need. Like I know a lot of people maybe did have paperwork, they did have the numbers, but they, they, you know, they've they lost them along the way somewhere, so they will supply that. And I know Excluded and I are, are working with that and getting that information out across their members. But yes, the accountants letter has been an ongoing issue um, and does speed up what is an essential, but it does make a difference. And that's... Just here on that HMRC, I understand that it, yes, they will do it on an individual basis for yes. people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they're not looking at it. In no, they won't do it as a collective. It's, no, they won't work do it for the Department of Economy. Yeah. It has There's to be the individuals that make, the, make the approach on it, but they are, I understand, they're wanting to give the information. Thanks, Chair. GDPR. Chair, I know I... Sorry, can I come in here? Guys, just first... No, Chair, I just... No, no, you're OK. Chair, it was just to say that I think that that letter is important and I fully support the point that we need clarity and we need communication. What I would suggest is that that goes to a number of ministers um, on the basis that uh, I, I think that this applies to all of the schemes and I think you know when we speak to constituents there's a lot of uncertainty as to what exact scheme now do they fall under and the localised restriction support scheme uh, was automatically um, extended uh, to, to people but I, there were a lot of people applying again and we get word back then from the Department for Finance to say no don't do that uh, because you will then come up as a duplication on the system so those types of communication pieces uh, as I say, everybody's trying their best behind the scenes, but it's just making sure that people know uh, what to do and when. But also, when an initial email comes out to confirm that somebody has applied, it would do no harm, maybe for a follow-up email, to say, you know, we're still working on your application. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and even if it is a, a bulk email to, to all of those people, just to say, look, we're still working on your application. Because a lot of people, like even today, as I'm sitting here, there's people coming on and saying, you know, we've heard nothing since uh, we initially applied. Uh, and I think that if we had a date, yeah. if we had a time frame to say, look, you know, it will be out by the end of the week, or uh, as was with the, the localised restriction support scheme. So I think at that point, as I say, has been well made. We we'll take that up, Chair. Sure. I, yeah, I, I would come in there and I would agree with, with Guy. There's a lot of confusion out there uh, among people, and I know there. Um, there, there, there's a desire not to have double funding uh, in places, but but not all of the schemes are alike. For example, the taxi scheme, to me, that is just a scheme that is paying for um, overheads that are incurred as a result of being COVID compliance. They're not actually getting funding for their loss of their business, which um, I believe that they should be, they should be entitled to apply for uh, the Part B. And that was the, the reason, Deirdre, that we were writing to the, the department to see if they could widen that eligibility criteria to include um, that sector, because literally their businesses have been wiped out um, uh, and, and their ability to deliver a service to people, you know, has gone. Uh, and the demand side is gone. So, you know, that, that scheme was open for the supply chain and, and yet that sector was rolled out in it. Uh, and the, the, the one that's been operated by the Department for Infrastructure is not, it's not uh, to recompense the taxi drivers for the loss of their business at all. It's for the cost of being COVID compliant. It's operational rather than uh, loss of business. We have raised that, that issue in relation to their eligibility for Part B. So, um, I think something. I just don't understand why it's completely wiped out every time we raise it. You know, the money's there. We can see that there's a, a, an underspend there as well when we look at our monitoring round. Why, why not pay those that, uh, that, that could quite easily fall into that criteria? We're hoping that we'll get officials in to talk to us about the support scheme so it's something that we can take up with, with them as well. Okay, so if members are content, we'll move on to 6.7, which is page 39 of your packs. Is there a response from the department um, in terms of the energy strategy bulletin? So it's to note. Um, it 6.8 then, page 44, is correspondence from the departmental solicitor's office about the retail hospitality tourism and leisure top up grant. Um, it's an issue that has been raised around the uh, multiple premises, um, so it's to note um, their, their scope for ongoing legal action. Yeah, so we, we don't want to get into that, just 
and um, we'll not get into a discussion on that. 6.9 then at page 47 of your pack, there's a response from the Minister for Infrastructure um, in relation to our request for planning officials to brief the committee. The infrastructure Dallow has been in contact with the committee office um, and is, is ready to get that organised. Members organized are content, members are content. we will. Yeah. Great, good. 6.10, page 48 of your pack, there's a response from the Finance Minister um, in relation to maintaining developing air connectivity. Um, we had corresponded to him on the 18th of December um, following the engagement with the airports. So the Minister has outlined that there was um, funding allocated £7.8 to Belfast International mm -hmm. City Airports. So again, it's to note and lesson. Chair, just again, I think it would be worth sharing that with the airport. Yep. Well, Chair, okay. can you bring your mic more towards you? Okay. Chair, the okay. other thing, I think it is worth noting that support was very much appreciated by the airports. I'm sure we all are aware of that, but airports are in a terrible state, running at about 20% capacity, and it's not sustainable. And, you know, this extension now is, is causing them further grief and concern, and I think it's worth putting on record our, our appreciation of, of that money that was given, because it is difficult. Some would argue that it's not within the remit of Stormont that we support airports, but it's vital that we do, and I think well done to those that did. And it may come up again, but I suppose it will have to be looked at in the, in the whole round, but I think it's well, you know, very important that we, we put on record our appreciation for the support for the airports and what is a desperate time for them. And they, they're doing a good job trying to keep the business going and they provide important links and um, under most difficult circumstances. We appreciate the work of those within the airport, but um, the money has been well received. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, 6.11 then, page 50 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Finance Minister um, on, in relation to the budget, um, and we've already discussed that earlier on, so just to note, um, then there are a number of items that we can deal with together, 6, 12, 13, 14 and 17, so that's at page uh, 51 of your pack, 52, 54 and... 24 of our table papers. So uh, there's a response from Lord Canoel regarding EU funding. There is a response from the Scottish Parliament's convener of the Finance and Constitution um, Committee in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund. There is a response from the Chair of the Finance Committee in the Welsh Parliament on in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, so again, it's all for the member. Oh, sorry. And then there is a one for the Minister for State for the North on the Shared Prosperity Fund. That's page 24 of your table papers. So um, obviously, it's something that we have raised on a number of occasions and probably will be looking at further update on. Chair, essentially, if I can sum it up, as every um, counterpart committee we've contacted shares the same concern um, at the lack of detail around how EU funding particularly will be replaced, but also the workings of the, the Shared Prosperity Fund itself. So there's uh, our, our sister committees in um, Westminster putting a lot of pressure on uh, UK government over that. Just for clarity, if nothing else, the Minister's already flagged up herself the committee that the lack of um, detail on replacement, particularly of EU funding, will cause problems. Uh, and while there's a, a commitment for the quantum of the money that EU funding would have provided, there, there's no specifics around how that will work on a, a regional basis and so on. So there's a lot of push um, being applied on the, the UK government to try and clarify that. Okay, so moving on then, 6.15, um, page 56 of your packs, correspondence from Fermanagh and Oma District Council in relation to pod Project Spadham. <coughs> Um, we obviously had heard from the Chief Executive um, of Fermanagh and Oma Council and sought some um, clarification on her remarks, so it's for members to note, and I'm sure we'll be back to deal with Project Stratum at some point in the near future. Um, 6.16, at page 65 of your pack, there's a response from the Competition and Market Authority in relation to the LPG market. Um, the CMA has made recommendations to the part Department on this issue in respect of the new energy strategy. Um, I thought it was a useful response, so if <coughs> members um, are content to note for now. 6.18 then, page 28 of um, table papers, the de departmental response on the localised restriction support scheme. Um, it's in relation to a uh, query of, from an individual. So if members are content um, that 
I assume we'll share that. Yes, Chair, we, we share that back to the, the correspondence. Okay, so that's all of the matters arising. Now we're moving to item number seven, which is the situation regarding further and higher education in the context of um, the new restrictions or the current restrictions. Um, so there are responses we had asked last week to get some feedback from the, the various stakeholders, the universities, colleges um, and student unions. Um, I think we have some responses back so far. Yeah, we, we, the time scale we were giving was very, very short, yes. Chair, so we, we kind of got what we could. And we appreciate those that have responded and um, the invitation is open to the others yeah, that want absolutely. to. Um, so first of all, at page 81 of your pack, there's correspondence um, from an individual about BTEC exams. And page 82, there is a uh, correspondence asking sure, sure. <laughs> why the um, further education of colleges that remain open. Then at page 30 of table papers, there's a statement from the minister um, about on urging vocational learners to stay focused on their futures. Page 32 of the table papers, statement from the minister in relation to the upcoming vocational like, qualifications, exams and assessments. And then page 33 of table papers, correspondence from the department um, about the additional restrictions and the implica implications for higher level apprenticeships. And then page 34 of table papers, there is similar correspondence in relation to the implications for training for success and apprenticeships ni page 35 of table papers there's an update from queens and then <coughs> on page 39 there's an update from uu so there's a number of issues um and it has already come up in in the terms of our discussion around the student support fund yep. about the various issues that there are for both students in universities and students in colleges um, members have already discussed some of those in terms of the pressure that they're on students financially in relation to being stuck in um, contracts for private rental or um, other university contracts. Um, and both Queen's and Ulster have indicated, Queen's says that they're extending their rental quality to the end of January. And um, UU, it seems to be on a more ad hoc basis. Um, they, they didn't have as many um, students in accommodation under their control, oh, dear, so yeah. theirs was sort of more, more easy to take forward and solve. Um, and in terms of the question about the FE colleges opening, um, just remind members that in cases where there's digital poverty, um, the FE colleges undertook to be able to make um, laptops and so on available on site where needed for uh, young people. And as officials talked about earlier, were um, were um, hands-on classes need to take place and can be done so safely they are still in some cases being facilitated whereas in others you know be techs have been so it, it's not that they're, they're they're all fully open and, and flinging their doors open to everyone there are legitimate reasons and we've had clarification on those from any openings um, and clarification from the universities about how semester two will go ahead online. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it, uh, there was some announcement this week from the Student Roost, which also has um, accommodation in Belfast, I think only in Belfast, where they are giving people a rental holiday, but it's for this semester. Yeah. They have been quite inflexible in relation to last semester, and I think that the flexibility has been introduced is because they're kind of an English provider and the restrictions have been introduced in England as well, whereby we had restrictions in place last semester where people were being asked to be online. And I think we, if the committee agreed, should write to Student Roost and ask for some flexibility for students here um, for last semester as well. Um, I think that's, you know, that, that's only fair. Obviously, there are a number of issues in, in the context of, of um, student issues, and Peter, you have referred to the FE ones. It would maybe just be useful if we could get some feedback from unions as well in relation to that issue about you know on-site provision continuing and hopefully there has been engagement and consultation with unions in respect of that. Um, I think John O'Dowd was looking in first of all. Yes, Chair, yeah. You don't know. Chair, in relation to BTAX, first of all, um, there, there has been concerns expressed that there was a, a perceived lack of planning around a response to BTAC in the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and that, that there should have been more preparation. Um, many students feel that they have been forgot about in the debate about A-levels and GCSEs, um, that they have somehow fallen through the cracks in, in this regard. Uh, I, I'm aware there has been some mitigations put in place, and, and obviously Peter has 
rehearse those uh, comments today of what's happening in further, or sorry, in our, in our colleges. But I do think uh, that there needs to be further clarity around BTEX. And also, on the other issue I want to raise is there's a strong possibility that the entirety of this academic year and even the next academic year starting in September will be disrupted as a result of COVID-19. And there needs to be planning put in place for that. The issue of students staining private contracts for rented accommodation, there needs to be uh, more advice given to students, clearer advice given to students uh, around the implications of signing a contract. Uh, even in August, September of this year, uh, they're, 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 they may not be in a position to move into that accommodation for, for a considerable period of time. So I think there needs to be a strong uh, resource put in place for students to ensure that they're and, and their families so they're fully aware of the implications of signing private contracts. But uh, in, in regards to tax, I think there has to be uh, further clarity given in that and also planning for the rest of this academic year in relation to BTEX and that they should be as prepared for BTEX as they are going to be for A-levels or GCSE. Thanks, John. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. And it's just in relation to, uh, obviously, the, the issue that we're talking about, but all, uh, specifically, I suppose, in terms of uh, the Queen's University uh, update. Um, obviously, we're all receiving concerns from students around uh, how universities are operating, and there's a number of issues around the fees and accommodation and all of that. The question that I would have, and it's been raised with me many times on Sunday, is, as you'll be aware, Queen's uh, chartered a flight uh, from uh, China to uh, Belfast. Um, that arrived, uh, and it's been raised with me, and, and I share the concerns around, given the fact that so much of the learning has been done remotely, you know, can that travel be deemed at this time as essential or necessary travel? Um, we, we need to get reassurance in terms of uh, all of the uh, health and safety assessments that have been put in place in terms of uh, that travel. And, I, and I, uh, what I'm proposing is that you know, this committee writes to the Department for Health and to Queen's University and ask, you know, at a time when we are under these restrictions within our own uh, communities, is it necessary that uh, such flights are, are being chartered. Uh, you know, is, would that be best to be done at another time, given the fact that the face-to-face -face learning is so much restricted? So I just think it's important that we get that clarity. It's going to be an issue going forward, and I think that the committee as a whole is generally accepting that normality is not going to be around for some time. Uh, and I know that, as I say, it's been, it's been raised, and I, I would like to get some clarity on it. Chair, sure. members content. We we write to both and, and seek reasons for why that needed to happen and what safety was put in place. And what measures um, are there to support the students yeah. self isolating? Because I assume they have to self isolate for ten days they will upon do, arrival. Yeah. Well, there, there was guidance. There was a further chartered flight for, from another location, and there was guidance, I believe, issued. I, I didn't see any similar guidance issued on that particular. Uh, flight. That, that being said, you know maybe it's there, but again, it goes back to the. I, I just have, would have concerns around even if there's the self isolating and all of that in place, it's the travel element, uh, and I think we need to get clear communication on that. Should we need to seek clarification on those points. Sinead? Um, Chair, just back to the student hardship. You know, students um, are unable um, to get any support. You know, from they can't claim benefits, for example. Um, yet they can't uh, work. So there is actually no financial support for them. So I think it's incumbent upon us uh, to, to ask the department to investigate ways that they can support and fund students at this particular time uh, as well. Now, and I think that we should call on private landlords to, to issue waivers on rental at this particular time if students are unable uh, to use it. Uh, and, and yet they, they can't get out of their legal uh, contracts. I think that, that we can do that. Chair, if, if it's helpful, if we write to the department um, asking if there are further ways they're exploring mm -hmm. to um, provide support yeah. for students in, in the light of um, what the deputy chair had said around a lot of them, and we've, we've heard those issues before around yeah. the, the, maybe the part-time jobs and so on that people did, they can't do now because those are gone. Um, and, and asking the, the department 
uh, whether they're undertaking any work around um, private rentals. Yeah. Um, I think both of those points are, are completely fair. I know when we initially raised the issues of student hardship last year, um, the hardship fund was seen as a way to deliver it. But I, I think just given the issues we've seen with it and the scale of the problem and, and the extended nature of the issues, that potentially the department needs to be looking at um, other ways of delivering uh, funding to, to students and support to students if, if required. Um, or, and it is going to continue to be required for the rest of at least this semester. I think the issue of private rentals, obviously we know that the, the executive has limited um, ability to deal with the issue, but that doesn't um, per, or stop the, the fact that we need to put in place that advice and guidance that John has suggested, but also, um, and I know DFC did provide a guide, advice for uh, landlords and tenants earlier in the year. I think students are a particular cohort that probably don't fall into the same um, categories as other private tenants and, and there does need to be that bit of flexibility um, built into it and um, if there are landlords that can put in place that flexibility then they absolutely should be making um, provision for students to waive rent or to delay it or to give holidays, whatever it is that can be put in place should be put in place and I think we should be encouraging that as much as possible. Chair, I'm just thinking in terms of what's been put in place around evictions, mm -hmm. but I, it might be worth going back and looking at that just to see how that might be applicable to students. If I take that away and I can bring that back to committee. Chair, the other thing is we, we'll be following up on the BTEC issue as well, just to, to clarify. Um, it was, it was mm -hmm. Mr O'Dowd was looking to, to make sure the BTEC issue was being covered. I think, uh, Chair, just on just both of the issues that have been raised, first in terms of Queen's um, and the the flight from China. Um, I understand you know, the question around why was this necessary when um, overseas students are paying what they're paying. That's why Queens will say it was necessary, um, and you know that's a huge source of income uh, for the university. Um, but in terms of, as you would know, the area around the university um, is now ninety plus percent. Um, rented accommodation, um, largely held by sort of a very small group of private landlords. Um, I think there's an important role for advice services for students. Basically, I, I agree with what the deputy chair said. The moral and the decent thing to do would be to um, sort of waive people's rent if they're not able to live there. Once you've signed a contract, you've signed a contract. And I think the sort of the sort of advice services being provided by the university and the students' unions, I think is something that's really, really important to just encourage people, just think and pause before you sign on to something because once you've signed it, you've signed it and there's you know, there's no getting out of it. Chira, I suppose to just on the back of that is if, if students have greater clarity about how semester three is going to work, um, you know. if they know it's going to be online and that they know they, they aren't going to be called back to campus and won't have to rent. Hmm. I, I suspect in a lot of cases, Mr. Stalford says they're on a, a rental agreement that lasted for the whole academic year, yep. um, but there may be some way of, of heading that off. And again, we take that off um, with the department and the universities, particularly around whether they can give that clarity to students about what might happen in semester three. Okay. We, we'll take those issues forward, Chair. Okay, thank you. Members are content um, that we've covered all of that. We'll move on to item number eight, which is our SL1 on the biocidal products, fees, charges, amendment, EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 84. There is correspondence from the department at page 85. The department proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by paragraphs 1, 1 and 11, M, 1 and 6 of Schedule 2 and paragraph 21B of Schedule 7 to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. The, the rule is subject to the draft affirmative procedure before the Assembly. The purpose of the rule is to amend the list of fees chargeable by the Health and Safety Executive for Northern Ireland to recover costs. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, you're not muted if you want to hit mute. Mm -hmm. 
Please, <laughs> please be just saying. <laughs> He's with another. These are totally me. Your man. Um, so the purpose of the rule is to amend the list of fees chargeable by the Health and Safety Executive to recover costs from industry in connection with work carried out under the directly acting EU Biocides Regulation EU number 528 2012. The amendments are necessary in order for Northern Ireland to maintain alignment with the biocidal products regulations as required by the protocol. The rule came into operation on the 31st of December. This is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend the rule once it has been laid in the Assembly Business Office. Are members content with the policy direction? Read. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, S number nine then is SR 2020 330, the Health and Safety um, Amendments and Revocation EU Exit Regulations NI 2020. At page 91 of your pack is the Clerk's Memo. At page 93 is the SR 2020 330, the Health and Safety Amendments and Revocation EU Exit Regulations NI 2020. This statutory rule ensures that the European Union derived health and safety protections will continue to be available under domestic law following the um, UK withdrawal from the EU. The rule does not make any policy changes beyond the intent of ensuring continued operability of relevant legislation and will ensure the statute book operates properly following IP completion day at the end of the transition period. This rule also came into operation on the 31st of December and it's subject to negative resolution. So if members are content with the SR, we'll put the question. Great. That the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2020-330, the Health and Safety Amendments and Revocation EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report. Um, item number 10 then is SR 2020-331, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of Relevant Period for Meeting of Registered Societies and Credit Unions Number 2, Regulations NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 108 of your pack and the SR at page 110. So these regulations amend the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act by extending the temporary relevant period for mutual societies um, to hold meetings in a flexible manner. These regulations substitute the end date of 30th of December 2020 for a new date of the 29th of March 2021. So the rule came into operation on the 30th of December. It is subject to confirmatory resolution and our members of content will put the question. So the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2020-331, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, Coronavirus Amendment, a relevant period for meetings of registered societies and credit unions, number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly, subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report. Um, item number 11, then, is the Northern Regional College Annual Report and Accounts for the year ended 31st of July 2020. Page 116 um, of your pack is the annual report. The CNAG has indicated he's content with the report and accounts, so it's to note unless there's any comments to be made. Thank you. Great. Um, item number 12 then, Belfast Metropolitan College annual report and accounts for the year ending um, 31st of July 2020. The report is at page 171 of your pack. The CNAG has indicated he's content with the report and accounts, so again it's to note unless there's any comments. Agreed. Agreed um, yeah. Item number 13, Tourism NI's annual report and accounts 2019-20. Um, the report is at page 253 of your pack. There was um, a 5.3 3 million overnight trips taken um, in the north in 2019, generating a spend of 1 billion. This equates to overnight visitors spending on average 2.9 million per day. Visitors from Britain and other overseas um, uh, areas generated 589 million. The North uh, realised significant growth of almost a one third in spend from the South, um, which reached 142 million in 2019. Um, 2019 tourism employee figures show an increase of 9% of 6,000 um, on 2017 from 64,856 to 70,802. The net expenditure after interest for the year is £23.6 million. Um, the CNAG has indicated he's content with the report and accounts, so it's to note unless members have any um, comments. No, no. Okay, moving on then to correspondence, 4.1, page 352 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Minister um, on the UK Internal Market Legislative Consent Motion. 
Um, obviously, it's not being brought. <laughs> it's kind of... Just been and gone, no. So it was to note unless there's any comments. Great. Page 354 then, there's correspondence from the Minister in relation to vocational qualifications for 2020-21. The Minister stated that in the prevailing month through stakeholder engagement, it has been clear that despite the best efforts of vocational providers, there continue to face significant challenges to deliver vocational education to students. This is primarily due to local lockdowns and the ongoing impact on teaching, learning, assessment and work placements, particularly in those sectors that have been most acutely affected by the lockdown measures. The Department has been continued to front the Executive's response to manage the impact of the pandemic on vocational education. So it's to note unless members have any comments to make, and obviously we've already discussed the issues at length. Good. Great. Page 356, there's correspondence from the Minister um, on the Judicial Review of Employment and Health and Safety Law. So it's to note, unless there's any comments. Agreed. 14.4 then, page 358, there's correspondence from the Minister on DFE's ongoing activity to prepare businesses for the end of the transition period. To note, unless members have any comments. Um, 14.5 then, 360, there's correspondence from the Department on the identification of national crisis scenario as designated in the Risk Preparedness Regulations EU 2019-941. This regulation sets out a common framework of rules on how to prevent, prepare for and manage electricity crises. It specifies for a common approach to electricity crisis prevention and management requiring that member states use the same methods and definitions to identify risks relating to the security of electricity supply. So it's to note unless there's any comments. Chair, just on, um, in relation to the new um, Jenny Piper, <laughs> the new... Yes. The, the, John French, yes. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't believe we've had Mr French in since he took up the new role. I appreciate it's not going on. Is it worthwhile down the line? I think at the end of November. Yeah. We do have, a, we have a, 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 an intention to schedule and we have communicated with yeah. um, the utility regulator on that basis and we are looking to get him in. Yeah. Um, it's just finding... When? Yeah, I appreciate that. As long as it's just on the it's on the radar. I'd like speak. to be worth at this point flagging up again to members that um, we'd sent out a a paper previously, but just to flag up again that that was not the Sony governance. Uh -huh. Um, it was just the the price um regulation around Sony. So. Uh, the governance um, report still hasn't come through yet, so we're still we we're kind of waiting for that yeah. um, to bring in the the regulator as well. So we'll, we'll see where that's at. Um, hopefully, it's sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, Fourteen point seven, then page five hundred and forty-two. There's correspondence from the Committee for Justice in relation to the SL one postal administration. The Committee for Justice noticed that the insolvency um, service, a branch of DFE, DFE, is responsible for insolvency policy. However, the Department for Justice has responsibility under Article 359 of the Insolvency NI Order 1989 for making rules regarding insolvency procedure with the concurrence of DFE. So if members are agreed, we will forward the correspondence to the Department for an urgent view. Great. 14.8 then, page 300, sorry, 550. 547, sorry, <laughs> correspondence from the ERA Committee regarding Youth Climate Action NI. The committee asked that the com the DERA Committee asked that our committee writes to the department to seek a meeting between relevant officials and um, the Youth Climate Action Group to discuss climate change. So our members content that we would write Great. to the department. Yes. Um, 14.9 then, pa page 560, there's correspondence from the Scottish Parliament Committee for Economy, Energy and Fair Work regarding the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, obviously, we've discussed yeah. similar previously, so members are content to note. Agreed. Um, page 562, then there's correspondence from the Treasury to the House of Lords um, on the EU proposal for a regulation to establish a single EU window environment for customs. The Executive has indicated that it has no objection to the proposal, so it's to note unless members have any um, comments. Agreed. 14.11 then, there is CBI feedback from members on Brexit and COVID. Um, the organisation has indicated that it will continue to for, for, forward any further updates. Um, it was a useful overview of some of the issues that have been raised um, and obviously we're going to be seeking some more feedback and briefings from yep. business organisations. And also yeah. be involved in our um, skills micro-inquiry as well. Okay. 
Um, 14.12 then, page 569 is pivotal report um, on new decade, new approach, one year on. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in there? Um, I think because we, we've now experienced some difficulties in relation to Brexit uh, and our supply chains and uh, the smooth running, would it not be appropriate now to get a briefing from um, the EU exit transition group so that we can actually see what we can do um, from from um, Northern Ireland's perspective to see what we uh, can, you know, uh, make sure that we can get rid of some of, of, of the difficulties that we currently are experiencing and our businesses are experiencing. So we need to kind of really understand uh, the detail of the difficulties. So we would require a briefing on that. Yep. Yeah, Chair, we're, we're looking to follow that one up. Um, we've already been in touch with officials around um, further update briefing um, as to where we find ourselves. Members will recall that we, we hadn't completed the statute book and so on, and it also feeds into what members were talking before about grace periods, implementation periods, and so on. So, yeah, we'll be getting um, the officials in. We're also going to be talking to stakeholders as to you know where the gaps are now that we need to be um, specifically targeting work on. So, yeah, we, we'll gather all that up, uh, Chair, and take that forward. Okay. Thanks. Um, so then, there. Page 579 is an invitation from Policy Forum and I for, for myself to chair an upcoming conference on energy policy. So if members are agreed for that. Yeah, great. Um, page 582, there's a statement from the Office of Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People um, on children's rights. So it's to note unless there's any comments. Great. Um, page 583, then there's correspondence from an individual um, on business support schemes. So if members are content, we'll forward this that correspondence to the department. Chair, sure, yes. I'm just Mr. Dunn brought up. Thanks to uh, Peter for including that on the agenda and yourselves. Uh, it is an individual who has been in constant contact with me. He, you can see there briefly, he is a golf professional at, at Royal Belfast Golf Club, which has no financial support to date. Is very frustrated with the whole system, and we appreciate this is a forum that we can bring it. I think it's important we we raise individual cases like this, and um, he, you can see there that the problems. He doesn't pay any rent. He doesn't pay any rates, so he hasn't missed out on the grants to date. So uh, we would appreciate if this is referred to the, the the minister's office for consideration. Thanks, chair. Thanks, Chair. I thank Gordon for raising that. But it's a common theme among um, golf professionals and others that are in those niche professions that just happen to be because mm. of the circumstances being able to appeal of anything. Um, but on the sporting front, I think it's an opportunity to raise it. Um, like all of us, I've been contacted by virtually every sports club in the country who have been who are businesses in their own right, run by volunteers, profitable businesses that are reinvested into the community and the sports club, but have been told under the current rules of LRSS that they are the only part of those businesses forced to lock down that are unable to access that grant and are being directed towards the Sports Sustainability Fund, which was established whenever sports stadiums were forced not to have spectators. That was a clear area for that source of funding. Um, is there anything we can do as a committee to, to send representation to LPS or the Department of Finance to raise this issue to say that sports clubs, members clubs that have been forced to close, who have bar and restaurant facilities that are unable to open should be entitled to the same grant support as every other business. Because yes, they're not for profit, but they make a profit and reinvest it in our communities and in our sports clubs. And when we talk about the impacts on mental health long term, without support, these clubs are going to go to the wall. Mm -hmm. They run on a, a really slim margin as it is. And I just don't see why they are being made to be different from every other business in every other sector. I think the same situation um, pertains to the whole scheme. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so perhaps if we've gone ahead... No, no, Chair, it was just a comment on that point, and I, and I completely agree. And I, it goes back to the communication point as well, in that a lot of uh, these sports clubs are angry uh, at the fact that 
uh, despite paying rates, despite paying bills, similar to many other uh, businesses, they're not able to apply for uh, the schemes. And uh, the, the, the localised restriction scheme is the particular one that's causing them a lot of concern. And I would agree, I think that there needs to be an action from this committee to put pressure on uh, to try and get access to that support. Uh, I know that the uh, Minister for Communities is up in the Chamber on Tuesday and I hope to take up the issue around the Sports Sustainability Fund uh, and in terms of the, the challenges there. But I think that those uh, members or those uh, sports clubs with bar facilities and who rely on that to keep the entire operation afloat, I think it's unfair that those are not able to access it. And I share the point as well about the wet pubs. I think that we need to communicate there again uh, that many of the sports clubs who have bar facilities are paying the same overheads mm -hmm. but not able to access uh, the wet pub uh, support. So I, I, I would completely support, and I think it's unanimous in terms of uh, writing off to whatever relevant ministers we can try and get back. We write to. Um, I yeah, that's where I like to have them, just so there's an overarching. Well, right, right, to the, right to the executive. Yeah, yeah. so that they have that on their radar. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, 14.16 then, page 584, there is a report from the Children's Law Centre informing the UEN Committee on the rights of the child's list of issues prior to reporting, so again it's to note for now unless members have any comments. Great. Um, page 741, the Assembly Committee report by ISNI, so it's to note unless members have any comments. Great. Page 745, the 17th report of the examiner statute rules 2020 to 21. Um, to note. Great. Um, 14.19 at page 44 of your table papers, this correspondence from John O'Dowd in relation to his proposed small scale green energy bill. So it's for members to note at this page. Unless John wants to say anything in relation to his bill. It looks like an election flyer to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not to add uh, to Gordon's comments or any other comments. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, 1420, then, at page 45 of table papers, there's correspondence from the, the Wee Playhouse in regards to funding for the soft play industry. So, if members are content, we'll forward that to the economy and finance ministers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, item number 15, then, is our forward work programme, which changes. Um. It's already <laughs> wrong, Chair. Um, we, we've lost um, on frameworks because we're not there yet. We, we thought we would be by now, um, that we would have detail on those, but that hasn't happened. So, the, the department's essentially waiting for the detail on the common frameworks to come through so that they can brief us. So, what, what I'm going to try and do is we've got our um, we've got a raise briefing organised for a closed session next week around um, underpinning economic principles. So, it's trying to sort of relate how that works with all of the schemes we have, rebuilding the economy and so on. I guess really to draw together what we've discovered from each of the, the micro inquiries plus what we're being told more generally from stakeholders. And then we're... Um, the week after the 27th is our short day, but we've we've got a new exit in for that. We've folded in the new issues that have come up today. Um, I think we're, we're postponing Project Stratum. There's been an issue around that. I think that's going to fall further in. Um, but that, because we only have this short slot for that, probably EU exit will be plenty. Okay. Um, I think. Okay, so members oh, can... Oh, I may have something I can add on that. Um, see, the, see the beauty of up to minute... <laughs> Oh, sorry, the ESF is, is delayed now as well. We'll work on that, Chair. Okay. We'll work on that. We try and, we try and sort out something else instead. Um, but a, a lot of it is, is just waiting for um, the likes of the common frameworks to come through. Okay. So then... Uh, okay, so any other business? I've heard nothing. Nothing. Us, chair. Um... And then moving on to item number 17, which is the date, time and place of our next meeting. Um, we have an informal meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. with um, Dr. Neil Comer from Ulster University um, in relation to the threat to part-time courses. Um, then we have our next committee meeting um, next week in room 30. Still this room, yeah, room. week after. Okay, so that's awesome.
Time's up meeting tomorrow, Chair. Eleven. 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 That's team. Um, so we think we've sent out an invitation already. But I'll admit that even if you've not accepted it, it'll be there in shadow. Right. Okay. Thank you. Touch and go. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is